The Florida Department of Health is working around the clock to identify those who are most at risk of contracting COVID-19. We are prioritizing testing for any individual who is symptomatic, fever, cough, shortness of breath, and has traveled through an area of community spread. We encourage them to contact their medical provider. Please don't self-diagnose. Describe the symptoms that you are having, work with your provider, and if your provider feels that you meet the criteria for COVID-19 testing, they can coordinate through one of the commercial labs, LabCorp or Quest. There's a two-step process, which includes a specimen collection kit and then a test kit. The specimen collection kit includes the swabs and the sputum culture that are collected from the patient, which are then sent to the lab where the testing kit is housed. The testing kit includes reagents, which are basically chemicals that run the test to prove whether the person is positive or negative for COVID-19. We encourage social distancing because it is very easy to spread through droplet transmission, meaning if someone coughs or sneezes near you and you breathe that aerosolized matter in, you are now possibly infected with the virus. We want to isolate the sick for 14 days because that's typically the duration of this virus. At the end of the 14 days, if they are symptom free, then they have the potential of testing negative for the virus but they do have a clearance process for those individuals. For the latest information on the COVID-19 virus, we encourage everyone to visit the Florida Department of Health and the CDC websites. The Florida Department of Health wants you to keep practicing social distancing. If you need fresh air and would like to do some outdoor exercise, that's okay. However, if you're around other people, Keep six feet between you when possible. Avoid hugs, handshakes, large gatherings, and close quarters. If you have a cough, fever, shortness of breath, or sore throat, stay away from others even if they're in your same household. Doing your part will save lives. Please visit FloridaHealth.gov and the CDC websites to stay informed. The length of time that COVID-19 survives depends on factors. These factors include the type of material or body fluid containing the virus and various environmental conditions such as temperature or humidity. Researchers at the CDC and other institutions are designing standardized experiments to measure how long COVID-19 can survive in situations that simulate natural environmental conditions. So until more is known, clean often, especially high-touch surfaces. If you live alone and become sick during a COVID-19 outbreak, you may need help. Ask family, friends, and other healthcare providers to check on you during an outbreak. Stay in touch with family and friends with chronic medical conditions. Please visit FloridaHealth.gov and the CDC websites to stay informed. The Florida Department of Health has teamed up with Hillsborough County government and other public health and safety agencies to address any impacts coronavirus may have on our local community. Not everything is known about the coronavirus yet, but the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, has narrowed down key symptoms of the virus, fever, cough, and shortness of breath. The CDC says these symptoms may even appear two to 14 days after exposure to the virus. If you experience these symptoms, you're urged to stay home and call your doctor. It's important to know the difference between symptoms of the coronavirus and other illnesses. The CDC says people who have the flu will often feel some or all of these symptoms. Fever or chills, cough, sore throat, runny or stuffy nose, muscle or body aches, headaches, fatigue, allergies. The common symptoms of seasonal allergies include sneezing and an itchy, runny, or congested nose, itchy, red, watering eyes, wheezing, chest tightness, shortness of breath, cough, raised, itchy, red rash, swollen lips, tongue, eyes, or face, dry, red, and cracked skin. 
You should call your doctor if you develop symptoms and have been in close contact with a person known to have COVID-19 or have recently traveled from an area with widespread or ongoing community spread of COVID-19. We encourage you to visit floridahealth.gov for up-to-date information and tips. Once the Florida Department of Health has confirmation that someone tests positive for COVID-19, we go over where they've gone and who they may have exposed while they were infectious. Then, we speak to the person and go over do's and don'ts. They are given a way to get in touch with us directly 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. When we check on the individual, we continue to remind them of do's and don'ts. Each situation is a little different. Some people live alone. Some live with others. Some may have to temporarily relocate to protect high-risk family members. We work with the individual, the immediate family if they have one, and community partners to ensure their needs are being met. The Florida Department of Health, along with its partnering health and safety agencies, is reminding residents to stay vigilant and help stop the spread of COVID-19. People with confirmed or suspected COVID-19 who do not need to be hospitalized or those who were hospitalized and determined to be medically stable to go home should restrict activities outside their home except for getting medical care. Do not go to work or public areas. Avoid using public transportation, ride sharing, or taxis. Be sure to separate yourself from other people or animals inside your home. You should stay in a specific room and use a separate bathroom if available. Call ahead before visiting your doctor. If you have an appointment, call the healthcare provider and tell them your symptoms. This will help the office take steps to keep other people from getting infected or exposed. Household members and caregivers who have close contact with someone who has confirmed COVID-19 should stay at home and monitor their own health and call their health care provider right away if they start developing symptoms. We encourage residents to visit the Florida Department of Health and CDC websites for more on this topic. If someone is exposed and infected with COVID-19, the virus will not show up in a test until 2 to 14 days after the exposure. In the early stages of the infection, it is possible the virus will not be detected, which gives a false sense of security. That's why it's important to have a healthcare provider determine the best time for a COVID-19 test. Please visit FloridaHealth.gov and the CDC websites to stay informed. The Florida Department of Health understands that some of you may be concerned about your pets. The CDC has not received any reports of pets or other animals contracting COVID-19. However, it is always a good precaution to wash your hands after touching an animal. People with COVID-19 are asked to limit interaction with pets and other animals. Specifically, while they are symptomatic, they should maintain separation from pets as they would with any household members and avoid direct contact with pets including petting, snuggling, being kissed or licked and sharing food. Please visit FloridaHealth.gov and the CDC websites to stay informed. The Florida Department of Health wants to stress the importance of speaking with your health care provider. It's a bad idea to self-diagnose and tell a health care provider I have COVID-19, I need to get tested. A healthcare provider may not take you seriously if you do. If you have a fever, cough, or trouble breathing, call a healthcare provider and describe your symptoms. Your healthcare provider will then help you with your next steps. To be safe, you should avoid close contact with others, especially those in your household, until you know more. Please visit FloridaHealth.gov and the CDC websites to stay informed. This is a stressful time for everyone, including children. Provide your children with opportunities to talk about their feelings. Regardless of your child's age, 
he or she may feel upset and have other strong emotions. Encourage them to share their concerns and ask questions. The following websites have more information on this topic. You can also email dohhillsboroughpio at flhealth.gov. The length of time that COVID-19 survives depends on factors. These factors include the type of material or body fluid containing the virus and various environmental conditions such as temperature or humidity. Researchers at the CDC and other institutions are designing standardized experiments to measure how long COVID-19 can survive in situations that simulate natural environmental conditions. So until more is known, clean often, especially high-touch surfaces. Hi, my name is Kevin Watler, and I'm the Public Information Officer for the Florida Department of Health in Hillsborough County. Florida Department of Health has joined next door to share information and updates that have direct impact on your neighborhoods. Let me assure you that your next door neighborhood conversation remains private to you and your neighbors. We only will be able to see your replies and posts in private messages that you send directly to us. It's our plan to keep you informed. It's important to prepare your household for the coronavirus. COVID-19 cases continue to increase around the state. A coronavirus outbreak could last for a long time and we recommend a two-week supply of prescription and over-the-counter medications, food, and other essentials. Also, know how to get food delivered if possible. Having a household plan can help protect your health and the health of those you care about. The following websites have more information on this topic. You could also email dohhillsboroughpio at flhealth.gov. The Florida Department of Health wants you to protect your family and friends from COVID-19. We are all at risk of transmitting the coronavirus to someone who may not be able to recover if they get it. It's important to understand that people who are older and those with medical conditions such as blood disorders, chronic kidney or liver disease, have a compromised immune system, a current or recent pregnancy, heart disease, lung disease, or a neurological condition are at highest risk for a bad outcome. Please visit floridahealth.gov and the CDC websites to stay informed. It's important to protect yourself when you go shopping. Wash your hands before One. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. I'd like to call the uh, emergency policy group meeting to order. Today is Thursday, April 23rd, uh, 2020. Will the clerk please call the roll? Is the clerk there? Sir, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Miller? Here. Overman? Here. Merman? Here. 
Ronister? Here. Caster? Here. Ross? Here. Lott? Here. Snively? Here. And Mr. Merrill? I'm here. Thank you. You have a quorum. Thank you. We're now moving to public comment. Each speaker, we have a lot of 20 minutes for public comments. Each speaker will have two minutes uh, to speak. Uh, our first speaker is Chris Ann Hall. Uh, thank you for uh, this opportunity to address the meeting. I am actually calling to express my request for a vote to end the Hillsborough County Safer at Home order. The either Florida statute nor Governor DeSantis' order requires in a local level order. And we and the people that uh, I have contacted believe that it would be better for us to simply revoke the Hillsborough County order and simply go with either the CDC requirement or with the governor's executive order alone. So we are responsible people. We do not want government handouts. We're tired of sitting around waiting for government handouts and for government to allow us to go back to work. We are responsible people who love our neighbors, love our community, and we will do what is necessary to keep ourselves and our people safe. And we want to have the opportunity to exercise that responsibility lawfully without being threatened to do so and to get our businesses back in order before we lose them forever. I mean, both the U.S. Constitution and the Florida Constitution require before the government takes our businesses through, uh, whether it be temporary or permanently for public good, we, re we are required the opportunity of due process. We are required just compensation. And the promise of a check sometime in the future is not going to keep our businesses alive. Many people are losing their entire livelihood. So we're just asking that you please go with the governor's guidelines alone, withdraw the Hillsborough County order. It's not necessary. We don't need to have greater restrictions on us than the governor or the would apply. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Kristen Halls. Kristen Halls, I'm sorry. Kristen Halls, H A W E S. Okay. Move on to David Larson. Hello. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, no, so I'm a small business owner and, and I'm a father of five. And I just wanted to uh, reiterate, you know, I agree definitely with, with what the last lady, Chris Ann Hall, said. Um, the direct impact that it's had on me, I saw immediately. I own a small woodworking company and the wedding industry and different events were almost immediately shut down. Um, I feel that uh, businesses know how to keep their area safe and clean for constituents and different people that are coming through and using, uh, as well as ways to have a common sense uh, look at doing groups uh, so that these, these businesses affected by groups and maybe some aren't going to be able to jump in and do business the way quick as others. But I'm seeing my bank branch close down. I'm seeing um, a lot of other things that are happening that are directly affecting us. And, you know, last week I sat through the whole entire meeting and we need a quick pass to open up. And, and I didn't even see you guys address the six points that, that the president had put forth. So let's go with the governor's uh, order and let's shut down the Hillsborough County order. Um, again, as a resident of Hillsborough County, a small business owner and a father of five, you know, there are people boarding up their windows that are not going to be able to open up again, not to mention the ones that have to decide whether they're going to take a paycheck because they have to pay their staff. And this needs to end. Thank you. Ryan Valdez. Yes, sir, can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. 
first of all, I want to thank uh, this group for allowing me the time to speak here. Um, I'm sure that these frequent meetings have been wearing on you as a whole, especially in the leadership role. Um, as I understand it, the reason for these meetings is because this group needs to reassess and reevaluate the fluid and evolving situation that we have going on here. Um, I'm a local attorney. I'm also a resident of this community. And uh, just to echo the previous callers, I don't necessarily want something as restrictive as rescinding the entire order in the community sense. What I would like to do is be easing in the restrictions that you have on parks and recreation, uh, specifically the trails and the numerous parks that are scattered throughout Westville County, um, specifically for exercise purposes. I understand the need to restrict certain activities, but there should be an approach addressing parks in a way that deals directly with the activities that are being conducted at these parks, not necessarily somebody who wants to uh, run or do any other type of exercise that is solitary in nature. The closure, the widespread closure forces everyone to run on the road and share the road with vehicles, not only the obvious inherent danger, but also the pollution that we have to deal with as well. Uh, I'm by no means a avid health freak in any regard, but and it's really easy to focus on the negative aspects with the situation with rising unemployment, and other issues with small businesses. Uh, I'm also a small business owner, but there's a lot of positive that comes from this too. And a lot of people in the community that are taking a positive approach and using this time to better themselves, exercise, and enjoy the community. Um, as mayor's, uh, the tweet came out of the mayor's office, Mayor Pastor's office recently uh, regarding Tom Brady, uh, it goes to show that there's already employees that are working at this park to make sure that they're not being utilized. The directive could very simply change to say, well, let's just make sure that social guidelines or social distancing guidelines are being uh, Mr. Ryan, you're, to. You're, That's Mr. Ryan, your two level. minutes are up. Your two minutes are up, Thank sir. You. Thank you. Uh, Jerome Perez. Jerome Perez. Nadia McLaurin. Nadia McLaurin. Okay, that ends our public comments. We're now moving to uh, public health updates. Dr. Holt, you recognize? Uh, yes, sure. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dr. Doug Holt, uh, Florida Department of Health, Hillsborough County. Um, over the past month, I've tried to share um, everything I've learned and understood about this virus. It's a lot, been a lot of information, and it has changed over time. Uh, I've also tried to provide the steps that are can be used to control and mitigate this virus uh, transmission. Uh, I think we all want to do the same thing is have as few people get infected as possible, and certainly bottom line is uh, to die. Um, today, I just want to review six key points that I believe are most important as we proceed with some tough choices uh, down the road. Uh, first, um, at least 95, probably closer to 99% of our population does remain susceptible to becoming infected. Uh, even if we assume that it's 10 cases for every one we know about, that's still less than 1% of our current population. Um, COVID-19 is highly contagious. Uh, the scientific term that we use is called r not, and it basically defines how many people does an infected, and one infected person infect. Um, if we're not doing, and I would call pre-personal responsibility uh, added um, in addition to the um, social distances added um, to that, and they're not, they don't take the place of each other, they're, they must be done together. Um, that R naught is probably five or five plus maybe. And just perspective, that's closer to a, a smallpox than influenza. Um, with our social uh, distancing and personal responsibility, this number has decreased significantly in a very short period of time, probably a close approaching one, and I think that's why our models look so good and, and so fast they've looked so good. Uh, 
if we can continue to get full cooperation commitment uh, to continue the personal responsibility, um, distancing, uh, personal space, uh, brief contacts with people that uh, um, certainly anyone we're not familiar with uh, or not routinely around, hand washing, elbow bumping, and mask. Um, if we can effectively do that, plus effective case containment, and that means that uh, we identify our cases quickly, uh, we find out who they've been around uh, and keep them from infecting anyone else if they are infected, we can keep that down, um, hopefully in the one range. But we all know that uh, if we do less of those, we can and likely will see uh, an increase um, return uh, with significant new infections. Um, the most important factor with this virus, I think, is the sneakiness, the asymptomatic transmission. Uh, third, uh, we will have a second wave. Uh, what we don't know is when and how big it will be. It all depends on essentially, again, I'll reemphasize just how compliant each and every one of us are in doing what we need to do. Um, there will be a flu season that's going to be coming. Um, so we'll all need to get vaccinated. Uh, you can get infected with both of these viruses. Um, so that'll be an important part down the road. We must continue to protect the elderly. Uh, just in our own Hillsborough County, 19 of our 20 deaths um, have been over in ages over 55. That's 95%. Uh, just to sort of get a better appreciation if, uh, for us in our county, if you're under 55, we've had one death out of 800. That's less than a, that's a 0.125% death. Uh, just on the other extreme, it, it increases directly with age for us, and this has been shown um, nationally and worldwide. Uh, between 55 and 65, uh, our numbers are 4%. Um, have died uh, in that age group of our known cases, 65 to 84, 11.5%. And if they're over 85, that's 30%. So, but I would warn our healthy, our young, um, you may have a lot less risk of dying, but you have just, you have a significant risk to ending up in the hospital, ICU, or even on a ventilator for weeks. Uh, and sadly, and I'm sure we know, all know unintentionally you could bring it home uh, to someone that you love. Um, fifthly, we'll talk about the modeling. Just a few points. The, we have certainly flattened the curve. Uh, the peak has come much sooner uh, and was lower than, than we that initially forecast, all based on um, all the work and effort we've gotten in, in um, support from the public to do what they needed to do. Um, the downstroke, the downslope is going to be more gradual and prolonged, um, but we must not forget that there's still enough virus in the community that if we don't do continue all the good behaviors of personal responsibility, it will have the potential to, to return with a vent in the night. Uh, six, finally, the testing. Uh, Mr. Dudley will give a, a more uh, information, but just to review, we have tested 1% of our population. Uh, compared to Miami-Dade, they have uh, tested about 2.4%. Uh, it did take us uh, six weeks, and that's not a fault thing, because it just was limited by a number of complicating uh, limitations. It took us about six weeks to test this 15%. Or 1%, excuse me, to reach 15,000. So what we're focusing on is, is how soon can we get to 2%. And so we're able to average 750 a day. It'll take us about 20 days. And if we can all get up all the way to 1,500 a day, we could do that in 10 days. Uh, the challenge will be you have to sustain that. Uh, and noticeably, demand seems to be decreasing. Um, I have, I've already heard about and I expect plans, there are plans to increase testing in focus sectors, particularly the healthcare system, um, 
because everyone, patients coming back to their clinics and their offices and for procedures and staff all want to know. So I do expect to see more testing um, in that setting. Um, certainly we're hoping and we're going to be getting our turn to uh, participate in the governor's initiative to do some testing of our long-term care facilities. Um, despite all of this, we must continue to have a system that our patients that are seen by our local physicians or, and, and the general public have a place to go. It must be available and uh, locally. Uh, the Raymond James, uh, our three new sites that will be online, Lee Davis and Plant City and Bruskin. Um, just quickly from uh, EPI, I'll transition to the EPI information. This is, again, high level. Uh, Kevin Wagner will provide his more complete and graphic detail. Um, at the end, I would uh, propose, uh, at least like to get the uh, feedback from the group on, on how often. I, I think these are not changing drastically. Um, and perhaps once a week, but it will, again, as much as you would prefer, we will give them to you. Um, we recommend we're going to start looking not just at the new case, we're going to start focusing on new cases per day and in three, five, seven day intervals. Um, we're looking for that downward trend in that trajectory. Uh, our totals don't matter as much as they had been. Um, the recent data has is cautiously optimistic. Uh, the past five days, we've averaged about nine. That's a significant reduction in the prior five. Um, um, I would remind, uh, again, that our number of results that are reported each day have been decreasing. Um, we'll also begin to look at the daily positivity rate to see just how many of our results are becoming positive. It's been very steady at about 6%. Uh, again, I'd like to see that uh, go lower uh, as we also increase testing. Uh, I will. Um, uh, I would like one final observation, um, and I think this is ties to the testing and the cases. Uh, Miami, Dow, Miami Day, Broward County, and Palm Beach are certainly known to have the most cases in the state. That using their numbers. Um, approximately 0. Uh, 0. 0.38 to 0.15% of their population has been uh, tested positive. Uh, about uh, 2.4 to 1.3% of their total population has been tested. Uh, so Miami-Dade is the most with 2.4. Um, in our backyard, uh, Sarasota, Hillsborough County, Pinellas, uh, our Infection, known infection out of our population is significantly less, 0 0.07, and we have tested 1%. Um, so that's encouraging. Um, our hospitalization and utilization now is, is um, stable to decreasing. We have 35 patients in the hospital. That's a reduction from 42 on a Monday. Uh, we still have about the same number of an ICU-19, but significantly fewer in, uh, on ventilators. Um, uh, lastly, I do want to finish one final update, a briefing. Uh, we've had the partnership between USF, um, their medical student volunteers, and their clinic. Um, and over the past three weeks, they have contacted 300 of our 442 reported cases. Um, 207 of those so far have been cleared by the CDC's non-testing methodology, and of the 100, they're still actively following them. Uh, with that, I will close and uh, turn it over to Kevin Wagner. Good afternoon, Mr. Wagner. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Um, we can now. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, members of the EPG and, and Dr. Holt for allowing me to speak today. Um, I, as Dr. Holt was saying that we will try to, if the EPG would prefer to move this to a weekly event of these graphical presentations, but I'm going to present, we received some comments from la earlier this week and we've added the additional information. And as we receive comments 
if that information is available and data is available, we will try to add it to any presentation by Dr. Holt or this one. Let me first start by identifying the information for Raymond James testing at that specific site. Obviously, Mr. Dudley will have more information, but I would like to line out the four weeks testing that the Raymond James site has occurred. Uh, currently, through those four weeks, it was an average of about 990 a week, about 3,963 total tests were completed in that four week span. And of course, you can see the additions from 857 on week one to additional 944, which was a 10% increase, additional 1,247, which was a 32% increase, and then a decrease in the number of tests of 915. Again, that aligns with Dr. Holt's uh, statement about the demand is so key in getting the testing. But again, at the Raymond James site, there were 3,963. Uh, part of our conversation prior to this meeting, we're going to reach out to the four systems to get a better feel of the testing that's been going on uh, at, at their level and try to report that back where appropriate. So we're reaching out to those four systems to get a better understanding of the testing in lieu of just the Raymond James site and the three new ones at the CRCs that will come online. Uh, one more slide with regard to the Raymond James site. Originally, there were 4,251 tests scheduled and 85%, 3,500, 90 of them showed up and got tested. There was a no-show of ratio of about 15%. When we flipped that over to the total tested, Again, the 3,590 were tested, but there was also an additional 372 who weren't scheduled who also got tested. I'm not saying walk-ups, but they were individuals who weren't scheduled and got tested, which made us our 3,963 total. So again, there was always a portion of no-shows, but then we, we overcame that with individuals who were tested who weren't scheduled. Regarding the testing, as Dr. Holt has alluded to before, we've tested over 15,000, over 16,000 in the community as of the 422 update uh, yesterday at 5 p.m. So again, that's the aggregate total, which was 2% more than the previous day. So what does that mean from a trend standpoint was one of the questions we were asked. On this slide five, we are seeing the number of new tests per day, and we've added the trend line where Dr. Holt identified that it's a, been a fairly flat on uh, the last couple of days with the number of new tests. So the trend line has been flat, again, 200, 200, 300, the last three or four days backward. So again, that's been the trend of those total tests within the community for Hillsborough County. Moving forward in the same vein and same thought process, this is the aggregate number of cases in the county, which was 986 as of yesterday at the five o'clock update, which was seven more than the previous day of 979 and six more than the previous day. So again, that's aggregate. The line always goes up. But what does the trend show us? The trend shows us a slightly downward. But again, we have to take consideration of this is when the results are reported from the labs, but we can see the last four days they've been under 20, as Dr. Holt alluded to, and the map shows it respectfully. So the trend is slightly downward. Um, I think this will be one of the interesting ones to keep going for tracking the next week to make sure that trend continues. And as Dr. Holt alleviated to, adding the positivity negativity rate on a daily aspect and looking at a weekly or three or five seven day trend will be added we just didn't have time to, to crank that into this presentation today uh, again we are at a one percent uh testing rate I, you know again i can't account for individuals who receive the test more than once but hillsborough county is at a 1.09 percent testing rate of the hillsborough county population Again, of the 1.45 million. Uh, these following slides are essentially the same ones you saw uh, Monday with slight differences in the data. Again, two or three differences in data. But again, the male female ratio is nearly identical to our population 50% female, 
48% male and for both the diagnosis and the total population. So no change in that demographic. With regard to this one, you saw this last Monday. This is the age by the percentage breakdown as Commissioner Overman was talking about the workforce. I added in the gender population of Hillsborough County as a comparison. So for females who are 25 to 34, there are 93. They are 15.73 of the diagnosed positives, but they make up 15% of the gender population for Hillsborough County. So I just wanted to give a comparison to see if any particular age bracket is exceeding the, the norm in our population. And again, doesn't look like it. A little bit higher on the 55 to 64, about four, four, five and a half percent difference. But again, statistically, relatively the positive cases are matching our demographic from a population standpoint for females. On the male side, again, the same thought process, looking at the population as a whole versus positive rates. Um, again, males, again, on the 35 to 44 are a little bit higher statistically and 45 to 54, but not great, but they are a little bit higher. So again, it's something we want to track, but it, it is, again, the workforce potential age and the 25 to 64 range. Um, but everything else looks about the same and looks about equal comparatively as the population as a whole. Uh, the demographic information, you saw this two days ago. Uh, I combined these charts just to save time. The Hispanic on top with regard to ethnicity from number of cases versus total population is about the same, 292 and 293 percent. The non-Hispanic has it changed. And then the unknown is 16%. Again, the census data doesn't have unknown, but that is in the FDOH data. So again, I can assume that goes to non-Hispanic, but I cannot be sure, so I will not put it there. Uh, the other part with regard to race and the positive cases against the, the population as a whole, white is at about 50% versus 70% as the population as a whole. The African-Americans, 16%, 17%, still fairly fairly close the other is a little bit higher on the daily results and then we have the unknown but again everything looks about the same from two days ago not a not significant variance and the hospitalizations dr holt talked about the number that have been hospitalized i've added the demo the demographics respectfully i believe this was in monday as well well the Hispanic has a little bit higher hospitalization of almost 3%. But again, this is a variable. We don't, it's it's a small small number that's being hospitalized, 150 or, or 140, whatever the number is, versus our total population. But again, it's a slightly higher. The non-Hispanic, again, is less than the general population. But again, I have the unknown variable. On the race of hospitalizations, Caucasian, Caucasian white is less than the general population. The African-American, again, is the takeaway to look at that is higher. It's at 26.5% versus 16.8% of the population as a whole. Again, I want that's something I want to continue to monitor to see if that stays up higher from a hospitalization standpoint. Uh, this one is new. This is regard the deaths that have occurred. Dr. Holt is 20, 21 deaths. And I added the, the counts because it's so important when we look at percentages to understand that small numbers can have the percentages that really affect our thinking. So on the deaths, there's been 13 white Caucasian, four African-American, three other, and one unknown from the FDOH reports. So when we look at that, you know, the Hispanic his, it, ethnicity is less death on the top at 14% versus 29%. The non-Hispanic is again 76 and 80 for 70.8%. On the race side, the Caucasian white is less than the general population whole. Here is why I added in the deaths. From a count standpoint, the African-American has a higher death percentage of the individuals who tested positive at 19% versus 16.8% of our population as a whole. But again, it's only four of 21. So that's why I wanted to show that 
the number and sample sizes needs to be a little bit larger or a little bit smaller, but we want for deaths a much smaller sample size or percentages. Again, we want to keep things in perspective when we look at all these numbers and tell all the story about the data for you the members. Uh, the last one that was requested to just add back in was is the death percentage on the far right hand column on 422. The total aggregate death percentage of the individuals in Hillsborough County was two, a little over 2%. Uh, the state of Florida is a little bit over 3%. But again, we have 21 potential deaths out of 970, 980 cases. Again, we have a very small death percentage, which is a good thing that we want to try to lower and eliminate. And with that, I open up to any questions and back to the chairman. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. Um, I don't see any questions at this particular point in time. Let me ask Dr. Holt a question. Dr. Holt, are you still there? Dr. Holt? Yes, sir. Uh, you said in your in your presentation that the um, the curve had flattened. Is that what you said? Yeah. Yes, sir. That if you look at uh, you look at that one with the cumulative number of total cases that we have seen over time. So that's the that is the uh, that's in reference to that, sir. And that's the flatten in Hillsborough County. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yes, I mean, you know, I, I uh, yes, sir. It, it, I think it, uh, if you look at slide, I think it's six, six on Kevin's presentation. That's, that's kind of the trend that we would um, refer to as flattening. Okay. All right. Um, I'm trying to see if I, for some reason, my computer's not working right. Who said something? Hi, Chairman Miller. It's school board member Snively. You recognize. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I just had a quick question of the 151 hospitalizations, and maybe I missed this number as I was jotting information down. How many are current? Are those current hospitalizations or, t or cumulative hospitalizations? Uh, that is a cumulative. We, we obtain that information when we uh, do our first interview and find out were they hospitalized. Um, on admission uh, or, or on presentation. Uh, the total number at, at this time that's in the hospital are 35. That's a reduction from 42 on Monday that I reported. And that's a, that's a pretty much a steady trend. Again, I would call it flat, uh, similarly to what we're seeing with new cases. I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. That answered my question. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, members, I can't seem to get my computer to move to show me uh, if your hands are up to ask a question or not. For some reason, I don't know what's going on here. So you're going to have to just give me a signal. or, or, or Mr. Just Chairman. Call. Yes, sir. This is Rick Lott. Mayor Lott, you recognize. Okay, I'm going to ask a couple of questions here. So I, I appreciate the data you say, uh, uh, gave us today. And um, uh, the question I had is for our hotel that we have a 377 rooms in, um, or available, how many of those are being utilized right now? Um, yeah, this Dr. Holt, I believe that's usually presented uh, in Mr. Dudley's report, so I don't want, want I'll let him be the single point to answer that question. Another, another question then. So to, to lead on to what uh, the, the chairman spoke about, that we flatten the curve, uh, and you also mentioned in your report earlier that the um, the peak hit us much earlier than we anticipated. What was the exact date of that peak, would you say? Yeah, I I, I think I, um, I respectfully say I don't have a, a, a specific number. I think, uh, you know, it depends a lot on the model you pick. And uh, I think you're gonna hear some more about modeling, but uh, I've sort of just been um, sort of, reading the newspaper what people say or project, uh, but it was certainly um, a week plus back would be my uneducated, inexact answer, sir. I apologize for being so vague, but... Um, and, and one more question, if you don't mind. Okay, I see other hands up. Um, 
the I, I hear a lot of questions about the you know the testing and the percentages of how many of our, our, our uh, what percentage of our population do we have a definitive number that we're trying to test is it two percent one and a half percent what what's that number so that we know what the goal is yeah um it's a I don't. I can't tell you an exact number that we would really uh, uh, exactly test um, at this point in time. Uh, I think what you want to do is you want to have a system that is regularly testing uh, throughout the next few months or more. And as long as you have that capability, uh, you know, you will be increasingly every week and every month, you're going to be testing more and more of your uh, population. So uh, the more you test, the more confidence you have in the data. Uh, but I don't know if I can tell you, I'd, I'd like to see us get to 2%. Uh, uh, and from there, if the trends are continuing with the positivity rate going down so we're not adding more new cases then then that's a um, indicator that the level of virus that's being spread is um, is not increasing and actually is decreasing so uh, again I guess I didn't answer either one of those questions and I apologize I'm sorry I do have one more question so when we voted on the Safer at home policy um, uh, several weeks back. I, the number one reason why we voted on that, um, at least that was the main reason why we voted on it, that uh, and considered the facts and the data that we shared at the time, is we were trying to make sure that we did not overwhelm our medical system and the medical capacity of our county. Uh, did did we come anywhere close to overwhelming the medical capacity of our county and our system? Um. No, sir. Uh, the, the hospitals uh, had decompressed quite a bit. They had opened up a large number of their hospital beds, uh, so uh, we did not approach their uh, existing capacity, uh, much less uh, need for the surge. I'll stop there. Well, thank you. I, um, I sure hope that we open up our, our system for elective surgeries here pretty soon, because I'm seeing a lot of citizens we have uh, that are in a lot of pain and uh, and things like gallbladder surgeries and so forth and friends I'm talking to they're uh, they, they're almost immobile but uh, they can't have them removed right now for whatever reasons until that that's lifted I know it's not a part of this board but I hope that happens soon because it obviously it looks like we have the capacity to do so um, just just one more comment I, I think uh, you know that uh, you know when we when we made the decision as a group safer at home that was a uh, a, a quite a bold decision. We were looking at the data and so forth to do so, and obviously without any previous, it's, it's easier to make a decision now with the data we have today versus the data we had back then. But uh, I, I just really think that we need to applaud our citizens in the community because without having, you know, super strict, you know, uh, mandates, our citizens, they responded and look at the numbers that we have to show for, uh, you know, I, I really think we have to give a lot of credit to our citizens for being a great close-knit citizens and reacting to, um, you know, uh, you know the plans that we put in place because to me the numbers show that they uh, they prevailed they listened and you're always going to have pockets here and there but as a whole uh, population for Hillsborough County they did they did quite well so thank you very much um, this is Dr. Yunash at uh, USF can I uh, respond uh, a little bit to uh, Mayor Lott's uh, comments and questions uh, Dr. Yunash you recognize Thank you very much. Um, yes, regarding to the uh, question of the percentage um, to test uh, Mayor Lott, I think the recommendation is sort of uh, not really dependent on the percentage. The idea here is to have a test that's going to be readily available uh, to anyone who feels like they have any symptoms that may correspond to COVID-19. So it's more of a clinical type level thing, uh, you know, the fewer cases that we have, the fewer tests you're going to need to run because the fewer people who are going to be symptomatic are going to be going in to get tests. But the idea is to reach a point where anyone who feels like they might have the infection can easily walk into an urgent care uh, clinic or a place in the mall or any place else and get a rapid test and know within 15 minutes whether they're positive or negative or not. Um, and that will allow us to rapidly identify the symptomatic patients, uh, do contact tracing, 
and try and uh, get rid of this whole sledgehammer approach that we have with the safe at home uh, mandates that we're uh, um, undertaking now. And um, I would just like to reinforce your congratulations. I will be giving a couple slides and uh, later on uh, based upon some of the modeling work that we've done for Hillsborough County. And I think what it shows is that the quick action that was taken by this group uh, reduced the number of projected cases and probably the number of deaths uh, roughly a hundredfold. Um, so I think that you, ha you guys have to be really congratulated for uh, your swift and decisive action that saved many, many lives. Thank you, Dr. Yunesh. Uh, Mr. Merrill, you recognize. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Because of some of the this comments in the public comment section and some of the discussion, um, I think it's important just to make the point that the entire state now is under the governor's stay-at-home order. And the governor's stay-at-home order supersedes our stay-at-home order and any other order across the state. Christine can weigh in on that, but so we, we as well as all other communities are operating now under the governor's order. And so any changes to open up anything beyond what's stipulated in governor's order has to come from the governor's office that relates to elective surgeries or anything else. So I just want to be clear because I think there's some confusion, uh, especially in the comments section about us uh, in, about us rescinding our executive order, it, it doesn't matter because it's really the governor's order that, that governs at this point. Thank you, Mr. Merrill. Uh, members, I cannot move my cursor to see who wants to speak, so to see who hands up. So does anyone else want to make a uh, comment at this time? Anyone else? This is Commissioner okay. Overman. I'm, I'm raising my hand, <laughs> jumping around. I can't see it, Commissioner. <laughs> I can't see it, Commissioner Overman. You recognize. Okay. Um, thank you very, very much, Chair. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Holt and Dr. Nash on your, on your reports, as well as Kevin Wagner on, on the data. Being a data nerd, I, I appreciate having it, and I've asked for a lot of it, and you've been very, very gracious at providing it to us. It sounds like we have had a, a drop in the request for testing for even though we've expanded our territory and we've had some drop in our positives. Um, and I'm, I'm certain that a lot of that has to do with the fact that people have been staying home and that's awesome. Um, my concern is we've still only tested 1% and we've had a pretty consistent 6 to 7% positive rate. Um, if we were to test, you know, everybody in Hillsborough County, and I'm not suggesting we do that, but if we did, and our, our positive percentage were um, reflective of the amount of people that we've already tested, and if it's consistent, that means if, if we have 1.4 million people and 6% are positive, that's 84,000 people within Hillsborough County that actually are positive whether they realize it or not because of the asymptomatic nature of this disease. And that's a lot of people. Now, I'm not saying we have 84,000, but I am saying there's a potential for that if we're not careful in uh, how we address safer at home and what practices we recommend as things loosen up coming down the road. Can you tell me um, what percentage or of the people that are hospitalized or what percentage of those that have been hospitalized have been going to an ICU? Does someone have that information? Um, this Dr. Holt, I guess, and, and I got, I don't, gosh, I don't follow the number reported hospitalizations because they um, are done at the, um, you know, at the start, but I, if I recall the number of, that I think was referred to earlier, it was uh, 100, sometime around 145, 150. So it's 151 uh, as of the state today. Okay. I guess just my numbers off the top of my head 150 over 1,000. Um, what am I, 10 percent? A little, 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 fifteen percent, maybe. Uh, that's a. I, I, I didn't fail math, but it wasn't my strong suit. 
Okay. I'll stop, stop there. Okay. When in those folks that tested positive, has there been an analysis of the folks that actually tested positive before we enacted the safer at home? So, for example, it, prior to that, we'd, we'd like to know those folks that got infected. You know, what what do they do for a living? Did, are there more people that are more susceptible to being um, infected because of their workplace or or their demographics or their household? I mean, do we have any of that work being done in terms of the epidemiology of those that have tested positive? Well, um, this is Dr. Alt again. Um, I, normally, I would tell you absolutely not, um, but I will ask on your behalf here, and, and I have sh sh shared some interest there with the uh, USF partners that we've had, because as I mentioned earlier, they have asked, or they've made contact with almost two-thirds of those cases, 300 of the ones, and I think the Safer at Home started around the same time. I don't know. It's very close, let me put it that way. And uh, they ask quite a bit more in their survey than I get back. I, I just know to know just uh, are they taken care of? Do they need anything to help them get over their illness and um, when they have fully recovered? So uh, I'll be happy to uh, try to find out more information and provide that update on Monday. Okay, and my last question has to do with testing capacity. We have, um, as you indicated earlier, we're doing about 900 tests a week. Um, if, if we were to test everybody in Hillsborough County or, or, or those 84,000 number I gave you, it would take 93 weeks to cover, you know, the folks that are positive. So I, I, what is our maximum weekly testing capacity at this point? So that we, if we need to meet the guidelines required by a county to consider relaxing safer at home rules, you know, what's that timeline look like? And then I'll stop there. Um, uh, this is Dr. Holt again. The capacity to testing in our community is um, uh, most uh, available in our private sector. Uh, done through the hospital or healthcare um, affiliated um, um, systems. Uh, internally, I believe, and um, from what I was shared with some of my colleagues, I think Tampa General has done about 6,000 tests. Uh, so they're, um, you know, they're, they've contributed quite a bit to, the, um, to that total number. Uh, we are, you know, we've, been, Engaged with them just to uh, be aware of uh, that they are doing it, uh, but we haven't uh, gone to that step where we uh, answer that. Your question would need more information from that sector. The the 900 that was reported, I think, from Kevin, is what we have uh, done at Raymond James, um, and so that's. A piece of the pie, but it's certainly not the total pie. I'll stop there. Okay. Uh, I still can't work my system here. Is anyone else would like to ask a question? Anyone else? Okay, hey, thank Chairman, you. Gonna... Jay, Chairman, it's Mayor Castor. Um, I'm sorry. It's Mayor Castor. Okay, you got that. I got a couple of questions uh, for Mr. Wagner. Is that uh, 3,963, is that the total number of, of tests that have been administered? Does, does that include private uh, facilities as well? In other words, if I went to my physician, got a test, do they only report the positive cases back or do they report every single test that was performed? And then um, also, I, I'm very, you know, very, very happy with the results, and, and I think that um, the actions that this group took, uh, you know, did had a, an impact on that. So I think that is wonderful. But uh, also, we need to keep in mind that it was a one percent that we have tested, and for the city of Tampa, it looks like our hot spots are New Tampa and South Tampa. So that leads me to believe that it's individuals that have access to the testing. 
So I am very, very thankful uh, to the county for opening up the Lee Davis uh, testing center because that is a very densely populated area and it will be interesting to see those numbers uh, come out as well. And Dr. Holt the other day, I'm sorry, not Dr. Holt, Dr. Um, Lockwood indicated that uh, we hit our peak, according to the Washington model, on April 3rd. And so we've had 14 days of decreased testing, but again, with 1% of the people being tested. And uh, he also indicated that we should be doing about 2,000 tests a day. So, you know, I, I, I think that the, the data on there, even the numbers, as I brought up the last time, with the African-American and Black community and the Hispanic community, if we don't know how many people have been tested, then the positive numbers really don't give us any picture or information that we can make decisions on. So I think more of a presentation on the modeling, like if we're sticking with the Washington model and not using when people are looking at and not using different modeling, which we on Friday, we got certain numbers and then on Monday, uh, they had decreased dramatically. And the, the response to that was that we were using different models. So I think we just need to, to pick one of those models, stick with it, and then present on that as opposed to these numbers that are difficult to make, uh, make decisions on. And that was more of a statement than a question, but I still want to know about the uh, question with the, um, the total number of cases or testing that's being done. Uh Respectfully, I think this, Dr. Holt, I can answer the question about the reports. The, and this is what, this is a comment we have tried to uh, keep clear. What you see with the 16,000 some odd number uh, is the number of results that have come back reported to the state lab. Uh, every lab done in uh, uh, um, on a person from Florida has to be reported to the state. That's, that's a requirement. Uh, what we do get is both the positives and the negatives. Um, um, most labs and all the ones that I'm aware of, with, with one exception here locally in a hospital, all report electronically. So as soon as the result, they don't report when they order or how many tests that have necessarily been done, but they do report all results that come back. So the hope is as the test, the difference, time difference between when it was received by the lab and when the results are reported out by the lab, if that goes uh, uh, narrow and less and less, if it gets down to two days or ideally, uh, uh, certainly within 72 hours, then you would suppose that the numbers that you're looking at uh, results-wise, total results for that particular day reported should reflect approximately the number of tests that were done by the lab three days ago. I hope that is, answers your question. I'll stop there. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, does anyone else have a question? Anyone Commissioner else? Commissioner Berman, Berman. Berman. Recognize. Um, I just want to ask Dr. Holt, is there still a significant lag between when we get the test results back after the test? Um, no, it, no. Uh, well, uh, any lag is, a, <laughs> but it is reduced significantly. When we first started this, it was, uh, 10 days or sometimes, uh, uh, but it's widely variable. Uh, all the tests that were done at Temper General uh, come back within 24 hours. And, and many, all, all the ones that were done by our hospitals, because they do it on their own, on their own property in their own labs. So the, the dominant ones that we're looking at uh, are the LabCorp and the Quest. And there are some other commercial, but those are the dominant providers. And um, they're in, I would say, on an average of around five days uh, uh, would be still, would be reasonable. You see a range 
that is less, the range has gone from uh, as quick as two days, um, but no longer 10 to 12, it's more in the seven day range. I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. And I will echo comments by Rick Lott and others. Um, I really feel like this, this data is driving our decisions. And as you can see, we're really headed in the, the right direction because of all the actions we've taken. So a very positive result, and I appreciate everybody's effort. Okay, then any, more, any more questions? Any further questions? Okay, we're gonna move on to collection and testing site updates. Mr. Dudley, you recognize. Good afternoon. Uh, just as mentioned in the previous brief, we have successfully uh, expanded beyond Raymond James with uh, Lee Davis, South Shore, and Plant City. Um, I'd like to thank our municipal partners uh, for teaming up with us, as well as the rest of the staff and the USF staff and all the uh, medical health uh, community as well. Uh, team did an outstanding job bringing those online. Uh, to date, uh, 644. Uh, collections have been executed. Uh, we still have testing uh, through tomorrow. Uh, just to give you a snapshot of the new sites, they were not included on the slide, uh, but once we get that week's worth of data, we'll be able to collect that accurately. Uh, Lee Davis, um, as of yesterday, we had the, uh, had scheduled 122, uh, South Shore 71, and uh, Plant City uh, 59 reservations. Uh, and within that, that also included uh, some walk-up traffic. Uh, we do have the capacity uh, to uh, serve the community if they do like walk up to the site uh, for assistance. Uh, future appointments, uh, moving into uh, Friday, we, we projected uh, another 220 uh, between the four sites. Uh, and we'll just have to continue to encourage the public uh, to call the triage line if they feel that they have any symptoms. Uh, there's no financial obligation or insurance requirement. Uh, any age restrictions, uh, just please call us at 813-272-5900. Uh, we, we just continue to work uh, in partnership with the healthcare community. Uh, there's other testing going, going on in the community uh, with the uh, hospitals as well. Uh, that'll support our effort and, and get more testing done. Uh, as of today, we still have not received our rapid kits. Uh, we're checking regularly uh, to see when we can expect that shipment in. And just as soon as we have it, there's a plan in place uh, to support those efforts to ensure we can get those rapid kits deployed as soon as possible. Uh, question was asked uh, about the uh, quarantine and isolation sites. Uh, as of today, we have three guests in quarantine and six guests in isolation. Uh, we currently have enough PPE on hand to fit the demand. Uh, yesterday, I did receive another thousand kits from the state uh, to uh, add to our resources to continue to support these new sites. Um, also, uh, we, were, we, we were able to launch the mobile home testing uh, as of this morning. Uh, so we'll receive an update for all new collections that were executed today at four o'clock. Uh, There's a request uh, last week for us to uh, provide those reports in the situation reports. So you'll start seeing those numbers in the situation report as well. Uh, so uh, we're looking forward to see how the uh, home testing collections went, uh, as well as the three new sites. Uh, we'll continue to uh, uh, take, take a look at the process and make sure we improve the process and uh, making sure that we get the message out uh, that we have expanded that testing and they are available uh, in the neighborhoods away from Raymond James and Raymond James still will be providing uh, uh, collection and testing as well. Uh, this concludes my updates on the uh, collection and testing sites. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Dudley. Um, I have a question. Um, the test at the other, at the three sites that you mentioned, um, they're going to be continued through tomorrow. Will they be testing into next week at those sites? 
Correct. We will continue testing it to next week. Uh, we do have the uh, collection kits and the PPE to continue those operations. Okay. I had a, I had a couple of phone calls uh, from some people that said that if a wife or a husband calls in to make an appointment, they weren't able to make an appointment for their spouse. Is that a rule or, or not? I will have to take that uh, for action. Uh, that that shouldn't be a restriction. Uh, just as long as the, uh, uh, the individual with the ID matched the reservation when they arrived to the collection site. Uh, so that, that shouldn't be a problem. That's something I can uh, check in. With okay, the please check in that. And my other question is, where are we with the mobile testing capabilities? Uh, mobile testing capabilities uh, started today. So it, st uh, it started today? Correct. Uh, yes, sir, they did. Right. So um, we'll get uh, a report at 4 o'clock uh, on how well that went today. Uh, we're partnering with uh, uh, AmeriCare and TransCare. Uh, they're supporting our efforts in that. Uh, we provided them with collection kits. So we'll get our first report on mobile collection this afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Dudley. You, you, you've done very well. We appreciate everything. I'm glad that mobile uh, af, uh, aspect of it is out there now because I've been getting phone calls on that. So thank you. Uh, are there any further questions of Mr. Dudley? Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Mr. Lott. Yes, Mr. Rick Lott. Hey, I just want to uh, tell Mr. Dudley and the group, th thank you so much for the center that was set up in Plant City. Uh, the team that you sent out is first class. They were very accommodating, make everyone feel warm and friendly. And the, and the students from USF, what they are uh, tackling this with, uh, um, you know, with a lot of zest. And so they're doing a really good job handling uh, the individuals that are going through our testing center out there. So to be able to put something together that quick in just a couple of days, uh, kudos to everybody. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Chairman Miller, this is Melissa Snively. I have a quick Stop. question. Ms. Stop, do you recognize? Thank you, sir. Um, uh, thank you so much for um, uh, everything that you've been doing with the testing facilities. I echo uh, Mayor Law in your in the appreciation of our community members. Um, I, I did have a, a kind of a question. It might be a little bit into the weeds, but it, it does beg a, um, a curious question. So we've tested over 16,000 folks in our in our county and, and just under a thousand are positive so 15,264 um, have tested negative so I'm curious uh, have you changed any of the uh, testing procedure or the screening um, so that uh, maybe we're, we're uh, uh, more efficient or more targeted in our approach to identifying um, uh, viable candidates for testing. It just seems that, you know, obviously with over 16,000 tested and fit over 15,000 coming back negative, um, that's a lot of uh, t negative tests. And so how agile are we or, or adapted are, are we when we're um, considering uh, how we're screening the, the individuals before they're tested? Uh, this is uh, Tim Dudley. Uh, one of the things we've done a couple weeks back uh, with the approval of BLH, um, uh, we've moved that age restriction and kind of opened that pre-screening up at the call center uh, to allow more folks to uh, flow a little bit easily uh, into the uh, testing sites. And also, uh, you received a briefing from our uh, Joint Information Center. Uh, they've developed uh, a survey to query out in the community. Uh, as well as we've teamed up with USF to find those hot spots. So I believe we are remain, remaining uh, agile and uh, getting creative with what we're doing to try to find uh, those spots out in the community. Um, I appreciate the leadership and uh, 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 ensuring that uh, we have the capability to set up deeper into the community uh, so that the word can get out and make it more accessible as well as our partners that have allowed us to go mobile uh, to, to also increase that agility, agility that you spoke about. Thank you, Mr. Dudley. Appreciate your response on that. Are there any further questions? Commissioner Miller, I have a question, please. Commissioner Oban, you recognize. Thank you, sir. I uh, see that based on the last set rep report or, or IAP report that we got that we've tested at Raymond James, Plant City, Lee Davis, and South Shore about 5,000. So it sounds like the hospitals have done about 10,000 or so, 10 or 11,000. So 
the good news is our hospitals have been a great resource and and Mr. Dudley, thank you so much for getting both the mobile and, and these remote sites out, because I think that's really gonna help people have access to the, to the sites, especially given the response we've had in the last couple of days. Even though our test, number of tests, new tests have dropped, we saw a really nice response from South Shore, Lee Davis, and Plant City over the last two days. The number we got last night was 206 from South Shore, 190 from Lee Davis, and 124 from uh, Plant City. So having those remote locations is really helping those get there. They may have difficulty getting there, and the remote is great. Um, I spoke with the crisis center this morning, and they said they were rolling that out today. So I'm, I just can't thank you enough. Um, and it's great that we have that. Is that going to add capacity to our ability to do the rapid test once we get them in? And I'll stop there. Uh, yes, uh, any platform in all platforms that we establish, uh, they're scalable. So uh, depending on what resource we get in and uh, uh, what group we want to target, so that'll give us that capability to make that adjustment. Okay, are there any other questions? Anyone else wants to be recognized? Okay, Mr. Dudley, thank you very much, sir. Thank Appreciate you. it. Um, Mr. Brandon Wagner, Federal and State Legislation Update. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members. This is Brandon Wagner, Chief Government Relations and Strategic Services Administrator for the county. Uh, starting at the federal level, the U.S. House of Representatives is expected to vote today on the new Paycheck Protection Program and Healthcare Enactment Act. A lot of words. Uh, it's the COVID 3.5 version we spoke of on Monday. Uh, this is a $484 billion budget supplemental that provides $321 billion for the Paycheck Protection Program, $60 billion for the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, $75 billion for hospitals, and $25 billion for testing. Uh, the Senate has already approved this bill. They did so on Tuesday, and the President is expected to act quickly on the bill when they receive it from the House. Uh, again, as we stated on Monday, funding for local, state, and tribal governments uh, were not part of this package. Uh, it's expected to be part of a future discussion, and amongst the big provisions that we'll be watching for are the ability to do revenue replacements uh, for governments and to direct additional funding uh, directly uh, from the federal government to the, to the local level. Next, yesterday evening, the U.S. Treasury Department released uh, final funding and guidance uh, for the $150 billion um, for the uh, coronavirus relief funds. Florida is expected to receive about a total of $8.3 billion. 2.5 of that uh, will go to local governments. Debate is now um, beginning about congressional oversight on how the CARE Act dollars are expended. Uh, we'll expect to have more information on that in the coming days. Uh, again, the funds that are coming down from the federal government um, to the locals flow through the state. Uh, communities with populations of 500,000 or more um, get their funding, their, their funding of the state share directly to them. Um, those with under 500,000 uh, will get their funding um, from the state. Also yesterday, the president issued a proclamation on immigration, uh, which becomes effective at 11.59 tonight, it is a 60-day um, entry ban for certain foreign nationals applying for permanent, applying, applying to permanently enter the U.S. on immigrant visas, uh, does not directly affect non-immigrant visas for uh, visitation, study, or work in the U.S. Um, it is, uh, it does not apply to applicants for asylum, refugee status, or certain other international human rights categories. Uh, and is expected to be in place for 60 days. Mm -hmm. At the state level, uh, we're aware of the governor's reopen task force meetings. Uh, they've been pl taking place each day. Uh, in the morning, one of the, or both the, of the dedicated working groups meets. Uh, they represent various industries. And then in the afternoon, the executive committees meet uh, to discuss uh, the day's actions. Uh, industry representatives are presenting their, uh, their observations and needs and questions and observations are being shared by task force members 
Uh, these meetings are expected to uh, culminate in a final report to the governor by Friday in advance of the expiration of the um, essential services and activities during COVID-19 Executive Order 2091, and that is expected to expire on April 30th. Uh, for those who are interested, all these meetings are being audio cast live on the Florida channel. Um, and with that, I will conclude my report and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. Any questions, Mr. Wagner? Any questions of Mr. Wag Mr. Wagner? Okay, thank you, Mr. Wagner. We're now gonna move into uh, the initial discussion of the necessary criteria framework and community conversation and considering community reopen during the COVID-19. Uh, there was uh, some, I have some uh, attached bits that came out with that. Um, we're gonna hear from Dr. Holt, uh, Dr. Don Donna Peterson, Dr. Marissa Levine, Dr. John Curran, Dr. Eric Eisenberg. I think Dr. Unash, you want to be included in that also? Yes, I, I, that, that would be great. Sorry, I kept a while to find the mute button there. Okay, all right, very good. So we're gonna start off with Dr. Holt. Dr. Holt, you recognize? I, I think, Chairman, that I think actually I'm gonna I'm gonna moderate this. This is Eric Eisenberg. Can you hear me? Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hey, how you doing, sir? I haven't seen you in a while. It's good to see you. It's good to see you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Miller. Uh, my name is Eric Eisenberg. I'm uh, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, longtime resident of Hillsborough County. And uh, Mr. Merrill asked me to join the call and to moderate this conversation uh, on behalf of all of my colleagues at, at, at USF. I'm going to share my screen now so you can see. We just have a couple of slides, but I think he, uh, uh, it's right on point with the conversation we've been having so far. Can everybody see that? Can everyone see that? Okay. Can you see it, Chairman? Yes, sir, go ahead. Okay, fantastic. I think uh, we're just gonna take you through uh, a couple of points here that I think are very resonant with what we've been talking about so far. Um, it's really interesting, I think, to think that this conversation about reopening, which uh, the public comment began with this morning, uh, is happening in every community in the world today and at every level. And as a communication professor, my point to you is that uh, the quality of these conversations is going to drive uh, the quality of decision making and of outcomes. Um, and uh, you should all be comforted to know that there's no one right way to do this, but some ways are better than others. And so I wanted to um, uh, suggest a couple of things that can guide your conversation. And then I'm going to flip it over to Dean Peterson, uh, Dean of College of Public Health, to get into some of the more data-driven uh, questions that you have about reopening. Um, but uh, before, before doing that, uh, if you look on this slide here, um, the first thing that we must think about in terms of thinking about this conversation is to think about reopening as gradual and has to be conducted with partnership and full engagement of the community. Uh, we know that people will support things that they're engaged and involved in. And so um, after you hear the technical report, I'm gonna talk with you a little bit about how we can engage more closely with the community about how we're gonna do this. It's super important, language is important, words are important, what we call these things are very important. And it's very important to see reopening as a dial and not a switch. Any kind of either or thinking that the economy is open, the economy is closed is not gonna match the reality of how this virus works. And so this is a dial that over time can be turned up or down depending upon the data that we get. And of course, what we're all hoping for is that we can slowly turn the dial to the right as much as possible towards where we were back, back to normal. Um, but it would be a mistake to turn the dial really, really quickly and then have to turn it way, way back in the other direction. Uh, we have to walk before we run, and all decisions will entail risks and trade-offs. There's no decision that you could make about this that is going to uh, be foolproof. One of the things that when we were preparing for this call, we talked about is that one size will not fit all. And in particular, there are two, uh, two ways of adaptation that I'd like you all to think about. One is that different groups of population, di different demographic groups, different groups of stakeholders, are going to require, require special consideration, whether we're talking about age groups, ethnic groups, socioeconomic groups, uh, rural versus urban, that kind of thing. Uh, and, and the second thing, and you saw this in the Johns Hopkins report you, you received, 
is that different business sectors and organizational sectors are going to require different treatment uh, based on the nature of their businesses. There are certain businesses that can modify fairly easily, and there are other businesses where it's almost impossible to imagine how they're going to do that. And so, again, gradual approach, dial not a switch, and one size will not fit all. We're going to need a nuanced and sort of strategically, a frag, uh, you know, a, a, a tailored strategy. So uh, both Johns Hopkins and the White House provided guidelines for a phased approach to reopening. And I want to turn it over to uh, Dean Peterson now, who's going to uh, engage all of our health experts in talking about exactly where we are uh, in terms of our readiness relative to these criteria. Uh, Donna, could you take it from there? Yes, thank you, Dean Eisenberg. Uh, Chair Miller, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. Okay, terrific. So thanks again for the opportunity to, uh, to speak with you. I'm going to briefly give an overview of this, and I'm going to turn it over to Marissa Levine to give you some more uh, concrete uh, information. I want to begin just by reminding all of us that the, the actions that have been taken, the Safer at Home orders, the, the, the uh, requests for members of our community to practice the social distancing, to um, be mindful of their health hygiene, disinfecting, all, all, all the things we've been talking about, were really designed to do three things. One was to reduce the spread of COVID-19 and to save lives. And we've seen that that's been a very effective strategy in doing that. It was also designed to protect our hospital capacity, as we've also discussed. But it was also uh, intended to buy us some time to ramp up our, our testing capacity, to make sure we had sufficient supplies of personal protective equipment for our healthcare workers and, and first line responders, time to enhance our case identification and contact tracing system, all the things that have now continued to fuel what has been, I believe, a, a successful response. But we understand, as we've heard on this call and others, that these have come, these, these practices have come at a significant cost to our, to our community, hence the desire to think about a reopening strategy. So as Dean Eisenberg said, and I, I know you've seen this, there are now um, more and more reports coming out that put forth criteria or uh, what would what might trigger a decision to uh, initiate a phased in reopening of our community and our economy. So on this slide are the criteria that the Johns Hopkins report that you've all received, um, the criteria that they provided. These mirror very closely um, the, the gate criteria as it was called in, in the White House report. And if you saw, um, if you saw the op-ed by, by, by Dr. Lockwood um, this week in the Tampa Bay Times, it mirrors his, his thoughts as well. Um, so what I would say is that all of these different models, they all suggest a gradual phased in approach and they're all driven by four key factors. The first is the one we've been talking about all afternoon, which are the numbers, all the data we're collecting and what we're looking for as you see here is a significant decline in the number of new cases over at least a two week period. The White House report also talks about a decline in the presentation of symptoms, COVID-like or flu-like symptoms. And they also talk about the, the positive test rate. Um, and what we are building is a robust syndromic surveillance system, which you've heard about already, um, that will enable us to monitor where these symptoms are occurring, where cases may be, may be appearing, and that's very important, not only to signal when it is safe to reopen, but to signal the progression through a gradual phase in approach. That's the first factor that drives these, these criteria. The next is the capacity to respond. And as we've been discussing, we are ramping up to have greater test capacity, greater platform for testing, but we really need to have the, the quick, um, rapid diagnostic testing capacity that will enable us to ultimately screen more people in the population and to identify cases, to do contact tracing of those cases. And I know there are systems being put in place right now, but we need a workforce to support that over time. And then we, we ultimately need to be able to identify those persons carrying the virus who are not displaying symptoms. And uh, what will help that is when we ultimately have a reliable test for, for, for immunity and that's, that's coming, people are, people are working hard to make that happen, that's going to be very important. Third, uh, these decisions are driven by our healthcare 
capacity, as we've discussed, we have to make sure we have capacity not only to deal with a potential second wave of COVID-19 cases, but to take care of all of the citizens in the county and the, and the surrounding communities who rely on these healthcare systems for their, for their ongoing healthcare needs, which don't go away just because we're in the middle of a COVID-19 pandemic. And the fourth factor is the community and the, the degree to which the entire community, the business community, uh, all, the, all, all the citizens in our community, are they engaged with us and are they willing to remain uh, re re receptive to the guidance that we've been providing and will continue to provide? So even when you start uh, phasing into a reopening of the community, some things uh, will have to remain in place and that's maintaining the distancing we've been discussing, Potentially, it means wearing face coverings whenever out in public or in a situation where distancing can't be achieved. It means adapting to new ways of working. It means adapting to new ways of how we interact with the businesses that we, that we, uh, we, we wish to support. It means that same hand washing, cough etiquette, uh, wiping down of surfaces that we've been doing all along. And it means staying home if we're sick or displaying symptoms. So ideally, when these conditions are met, so it's not just what the data says about the number of cases, but it's making sure we have all of these other capacities as are outlined here, then we can move into a gradual phased in reopening. All of these reports suggest that each phase be followed by a two to three week period where we pay attention to the data and make sure that our reopening hasn't caused harm. If all is well, as Dean Eisenberg said, we can turn up the dial uh, open further, wait another two to three weeks, and if all is well, we can then start to get toward a nearly fully open community while we await ultimately the development of, ex of a vaccine and the herd immunity, which we need to keep this virus at bay well into the future. So with that is just a general overview, uh, hoping to walk, helping you understand what these principles are. I'm gonna turn it over to Dodge Levine, who can talk about some more specifics and where we are uh, on this criteria, Dr. Levine. Actually, Dean, you've covered uh, it pretty well. I think that the critical component here is the work that's being done to make sure that the policymakers have the dashboard that they need to be able to know uh, when the gating criteria and these other criteria are met, and then um, to be able to reevaluate, as you've said. I think the only thing I would add, because your overview was uh, really comprehensive, is that it's going to require a regional effort. So in addition to what you're doing here in Hillsboro, um, the regional coordination and planning is, is probably going to be even more critical than ever. And all of the information you hear about communicating with the public uh, also will require a coordinated, uh, unified message so that it's really clear to people what the region is doing, what their role is, and what to expect in terms of follow-up and feedback. And I'm sure uh, Dean Eisenberg will talk more about that. But Dean, you've covered it pretty well. I'll leave it to the others to uh, move forward. Well, thanks, uh, Marissa. I don't know if this is a good place for um, Tom Unash to share some of what you learned in the modeling that we've been doing to kind of give a sense of what this means, what gradual reopening means. Dr. Ganesh. Oh, sorry, I was waiting to be. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, I can uh, share my screen. I, I, unfortunately, the uh, the code on the model that we're developing uh, kind of blew up when we tried to start to model um, um, the uh, relative percentages of uh, releasing the social distancing over what we have. But I can show you uh, two extremes here, uh, one of which uh, will be what would have happened if we had done nothing um, early on uh, to give you guys an idea of what the effect was of introducing the social distancing uh, that you did. And the second is what would happen if we actually just went back to the way we were as of May 1st and do, uh, have doing a, 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 com a complete opening. So um, I would like to find, let's see, share content. There we go. And let me see, there we go. So uh, can people see that screen here? Oh, it's gonna be kind of tough, but we can see it. Uh, let me uh, see if I can uh, expand this out. What this is is actually it's showing, if you just look at the two top panels here, um, the effect of the epidemic uh, that had happened here with the lockdown 
and also what would have happened had we not done um, a uh, social distancing protocol uh, protocol so if we start on the uh, right hand side um, what we could see is that these are actually listed in hundreds of thousands of cases that um, if we had done nothing, we would also be, be approaching the peak of the epidemic sometime towards late May. And the peak of the epidemic would be somewhere in excess of 235,000 cases that we would have had. Um, looking at the numbers that I have just pulled from the state of Florida, uh, probably 16% of those would have been hospitalized. 16% uh, of 235,000 is roughly um, 39,000 individuals who would need a hospital bed. We have 4,000 available total in the uh, Hillsborough County, Tampa Bay area. Um, and so we would have completely overwhelmed the medical system. On the other hand, if you look towards the left-hand side, this is actually what happened. And here, uh, the, the y-axis is in hundreds rather than in hundreds of thousands. Uh, and you can see that our epidemic actually peaked somewhere around April 8th or April 9th. Uh, with a total number of, uh, of um, uh, individuals infected, uh, probably somewhere in the area of around 400 cases. Um, and we, again, with 16%, we would probably ended up with uh, very few of those in the hospital, um, and indicates that probably what we, we've done by doing the social distancing here has been to result in um, probably a hundredfold reduction in the epidemic uh, over what we would have seen had nothing been done. So um, this also corresponds to what Dr. Holt had mentioned previously, though, which is that uh, at this point now, we've really done a really great job of protecting our people, but we still have 99% of the people that are um, susceptible. So not surprisingly, if we do a complete reopening uh, starting on the 1st of May uh, and just open everything up, uh, you know, Raymond James Stadium and um, the Tropicana Field and uh, restaurants and concerts and no social distancing, uh, what we are predicting is that the epidemic is going to basically reignite and we'll be basically back in the same position we were um, in late uh, February, early March. Um, we will actually have a really large impact, uh, a large peak of um, infections here with about 250, 275,000 confirmed cases uh, peaking out around uh, the 19th or 20th of June, just in time for Father's Day. Uh, which will then uh, reduce down uh, reduce down from there. Again, 275, 15% of that, you're looking at, again, around 39,000 or 40,000 hospital beds um, that are going to be necessary uh, over a, a actual number of hospital beds that we have of um, around 4,000. So there are going to be a lot of people who aren't going to be able to get help if we actually had done that. Now, obviously, we're not going to do this. Uh, we're going to go ahead and we're going to try and move a lot more slowly. And I had hoped to have the uh, models for uh, reducing the social distancing by 25, 50, and 75% available for you today. But as I said, there turned out to be a bug in the code in the model that we're developing. And uh, my collaborator, Edwin Michael, is working on that now. And I should be able to have those estimates for you on Monday, for the meeting on Monday. Um, but the take-home message here is that um, the community and um, you guys did a really great job um, by uh, actually going ahead and instituting the social distancing. We dramatically reduced the epidemic as a result. Um, but unfortunately, we still have a lot of uh, symptom or susceptible people there. And if we just open the floodgates now, we're going to be right back in the same situation we were uh, six weeks or uh, eight weeks ago. And uh, this epidemic could easily reignite. So with that, I'll uh, um, turn it back over to you, uh, Commissioner. Thank you, uh, Mr. D Dr. Nash. Um, Dr. Eisenberg? Dr. Eisenberg? Hold on, I'm, I'm muted, hold on. No, I'm- We can hear you, we can hear you now. Okay, good. Um, Donna, do you have anything else that you or your team would like to add? Um, no, I think I think it's important to get to your, to the, your last- Okay. Point, this is Marissa, could I just add one point? Please. Because uh, there's been a lot of discussion about testing. I just wanted to emphasize the fact that there's another group of folks who we need to make sure we adequately can test. We've talked about protecting healthcare workers, but as we reopen, there are going to be all types of workers in critical and maybe not so uh, non-essential areas who will likely require testing. So 
we need to make sure we're factoring that into the overall uh, community testing need. Thank you, Marissa. Yeah, and I think that actually that could be uh, a pretty effective way as part of an early plan to make sure that we we uh, we test those folks. So uh, the last part of the presentation, this is the last slide, uh, really goes to something that we've been hinting at all along, which is that we understand from the science that opening has got to be gradual so that we don't go back to where we were. And it also has to be engaged. And so uh, you'll see here for the first bullet is that we have to feel comfortable that the data are showing that in the gates and the criteria that we can move forward. And then the se second step is to start implementing targeted communication outreach to different uh, stakeholder groups. And I've been speaking with Hillsborough County uh, Communication, Leanna Lopez and others. We're talking about doing virtual town halls organized by economic sector, uh, where we have a detailed conversation about what's possible. I think there's so many granular questions. If a restaurant wants to be to reopen, how can it reopen? What would it mean? Can you practice social distancing and reopening? Um, what about the universities? What about schools? And they're, and they're different issues, you know what I mean? They're related, but they're different issues. And so I think we need to really begin almost immediately to start thinking about how we're gonna have that community engagement. And then finally, and I think this is where the uncertainty is really making people anxious, is we need to begin as leaders to visualize for people what a future scenario, future scenarios might look like. Um, in my own mind, it's, it's comforting sometimes when I hear the clinicians say to me, well, we'll probably have an effective treatment in six months and a vaccine in 18 months. So, you know, how long is this really gonna be? Six months, 12 months, 18 months? And then Donna started to allude to this very interesting question of what does the new normal look like? Uh, well, you've all seen the comments on Facebook. Will we ever shake hands again? Uh, or are we done shaking hands as, as a society? Which practices are gonna return? Which practices are gonna change or disappear? Somebody said to me the other day that after 9-11, we had to adjust the way that we think about air travel. And there, you know, it's, 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 in a way, it's a terrible analogy, but there's some truth to it, which is to say, we're gonna have to adjust the way we behave out in public, at least for the short term until we have a vaccine. Um, and then finally, there are some things that we've learned from this uh, that are actually going to be changes that will maybe be improvements. Maybe we will have a different relationship with technology. Maybe there will be new market opportunities that will come around. Uh, I can tell you that grocery stores have been fighting against delivery for many, many years, and I think they're all doing it now. Uh, you see things with uh, communication technology. Uh, there's going to be pressure for new economic policies and approaches to how we deal with the elderly and long-term care and things like that. And so I think th beginning to think about what the longer term future is also going to be something we're going to need to engage with our communities about. So that's my presentation and uh, I would love uh, uh, any questions and uh, our whole team at USF is uh, prepared to uh, respond. Okay. This is Andy Ross, I have a question. Hold on, uh, go ahead, uh, Mayor Ross. Okay, my question is for Dr. Unash. Is he still on? Dr. Unash? Yes, I'm here. He's there. Go ahead. Dr. Unash, this is Andy Ross from Temple Terrace. Um, good presentation. Thank you. I did have a question about, um, first of all, there's, I'm pretty sure there's consensus that some of the measures that have been put in place by all levels of government have had a positive impact on reducing the, the numbers of infections and flat curve. But I'm curious, how is it possible to establish with accuracy what those numbers would have looked like without certain measures? There's so many variables in this. How can we know for certain that, you know, 10 or 12 or 15 or whatever the number is that was on your slide, how many people would have been affected had these measures not have been taken? And then further, how can we quantify which of those measures had the biggest impact and which one of them didn't because we did all of them at the same time. So I'm, I'm just curious, how can we establish with certainty what would have happened had things been done a little different? Um, well, the answer to that is, is that we, we can't, uh, we can establish that fairly easily because um, basically what you've got here uh, with a respiratory infection like this, 
um, is a model that's very similar to a uh, single uh, single state chemical reaction. Um, very similar to radioactive decay, for example, because what you have are people who are moving uh, with radioactive decay, you have a substrate, which then moves to a product, correct, at a certain rate. And here, basically, what we're looking at is the same thing. We have substrates, which are susceptible people, moving to the product, which are people who are recovered or dead. Um, but for our cases, we put them into a dead-end state. They, they're no longer susceptible. And based upon the uh, rate of increase that we can measure early on from the Chinese data and some of the other data, we can predict um, how long it takes for uh, a case to double or triple, or um, as um, Dr. Holt said, in this case, uh, the R value is close to six. So it's going up sixfold every time a generation of the virus comes along. And in, the, in what we've seen, that was about 4.5 days. So just like in a chemical reaction, you start off with a large amount of substrate, uh, it starts to go through, you start to run out of substrate, it begins to decay and everything goes to the product and you get a curve just like you, what you saw there, which is the rate of uh, substrates being converted to products or susceptible people being converted to um, now immune people or, or dead people. So that's actually really quite easy to model in the absence. Um, the preference, uh, that's where the devil gets in the details. And I agree with you. Um, we are going to be able to start to model um, based upon uh, what we know, um, what the, the effects can be if we reduce the social distancing and allow the reaction to, uh, to occur a little bit more quickly um, at certain percentages. But how to go back and actually um, relate that to specific actions and activities is going to be rather difficult. Um, you know, one example that I use is let's say we open up all elective surgeries. Okay, um, how much of an overall social distancing reduction, effectiveness reduction, is that going to be? Um, my guess is that there, as a percentage out there right now, there are probably a low percentage of people in, the, in our communities that need elective surgeries. Maybe, what, 5% to be generous that uh, would actually like to go out and get a uh, gallbladder removed or um, a knee replacement done or uh, an implant done in their, um, in their uh, lower jaw, for example. Um, and if they do this, it's going to be done in a in doctor's office where everybody's going to be maintaining some good infection control measures, wearing masks, um, washing their hands, wearing gloves, and so forth. So my guess is that the, uh, the reduction in the effectiveness of social distancing of allowing that is going to be negligible. And um, it won't really matter. On the other hand, if we go out and we say we're going to open up all of our restaurants again, my guess is that the effect of that uh, is going to be quite substantial. So um, one advantage that we have here, I think, in Florida is uh, many countries in Europe are already beginning to open up and uh, are making movements towards uh, opening up restaurants and shops and things like that. Other states in this country are trying to move a little bit more quickly than we are. Um, Georgia, I think, is a great example of that. I think we're going to be able to sit back and learn from what happens in those countries to start to be able to look what they have done and to try and get an estimate of what the effectiveness of the different uh, social distancing measures are by what they actually start to take off in, uh, in their particular situations and uh, how much it has an effect on the, um, the overall rate of infection. So, you know, I can almost guarantee that what we do here is going to re result in an increase in the infections because we have such a very large um, susceptible population that's there. Uh, the real key here is going to be developing uh, policies uh, moving forward that allow us to allow uh, keep that uh, increase in the infection level well below what will overwhelm our healthcare system, and to do it in such a way that we protect the most vulnerable people and uh, result in the fewest uh, severe cases and fatalities as possible. But it's going to be an iterative process, I believe, moving forward. We're going to have to try things, as Dr. Peterson said, wait for a few weeks, look to see what happens. And if things look good, then we can take another step and wait to see what happens and then take another step. But um, unfortunately, nobody's ever been through this before. This is the first time in history that we've really understood uh, the whole process of the infection and are trying to actually uh, go ahead and make these policy changes. Um, and we have no prior data to really rely upon. So we're going to be, in some ways, really uh, walking very carefully 
and having to uh, proceed quite carefully here. Thank you, doctor. Okay, let like I'm back in business. Question, please. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let like I'm back in business. So I don't know who came first. So I'm going to go by what I have here. Commissioner Oval, when you recognize. Thank you, Chair. I truly appreciate it. And this report has been excellent. You've given us a lot of good data. And I think what I heard was that our um, basically in both the John Hopkins plan and the, um, the plan out of the White House is there are there are several steps that we have to accomplish as we start considering what we need to do as far as our, our workforce and our and our citizens. That's to get um, the screening and this testing up, which we're doing, uh, which we it sounds like with rapid testing available, depending on what that supply looks like, we can start doing effectively. We need the syndromic research that Dr. Yunash's folks will do and have that have enough data to matter. Um, and we need to ensure sentinel surveillance, surveillance to be able to identify asymptomatic, asymptomatic folks. This is both in both reports. And I don't know where we are in the ability to do those three things uh, well. Um, the healthcare system is doing their, their job. They're, they're making sure they have room in the hospitals and we can start working on plans for safe workers. But, but where are we with the syndromic testing and the surveillance to be able to do that? Because those are the first steps we have to achieve. Who are you addressing that question to? Um, well, it's a combination of Dr. Holt and our USF team that's supporting that effort. Which, uh, who would like to answer that question? Well, this Dr. Holt, let me start, but I think it's important, and I, and I also would love or need the uh, input from my colleagues. Um, the um, syndrome or the, any survey, monitoring the level of COVID-19 activity, as we've talked about, and I think Dr. Younes clarified that the testing capability and capacity needs to be readily available. Um, and so, you know, that is a critical step. Does it need to be uh, present in its entirety before you be take that first step? Uh, that's not so clear to me. Um, I do know you have to see a downward trajectory of your number of cases and the level of activity in your virus, in your community. The syndromic surveillance will be an additional way to give some hopeful validation for that. Um, the testing, I think we've talked a lot about, I, I expect to see more, especially as they advance and we get more rapid testing and perhaps testing that can be obtained without using an N95. The healthcare system, um, again, I think we're all feel solid about that. They are already beginning to figure out how they're going to have a COVID side of the hospital. I'm not entirety, but they're going to have a COVID area and a non-COVID, and anybody coming in, I suspect, will be tested to determine their, their location of care um, or procedure. Um, the public health capacity to do contact tracing, uh, we're at right now trying to assess just what does it take now that our numbers have been down for the last week. If we did the full and complete and quickly comprehensive interview of every close contact that therefore would be at risk for being infected and ensuring uh, their compliance and their cooperation to remain isolated, uh, you know, what what does that take in manpower or staff hours? Um, but we're also looking at technology to enhance that. And I know locally there's efforts uh, here within, again, USF and Tampa General that are participating in um, ways that will help us do that. Um, so I think what's important is those efforts have to move fast in the next um, you know, several weeks or more while if there is a gradual step forward, which the governor, I think as Mr. Merrill said, is going to take the first step, then we have to be certainly ready with the capabilities to monitor closely the amount of virus, 
we have that involves as much testing as the surveillance, uh, syndromic surveillance. We have to have our um, public health capacity to identify and and uh, contain all the exposed cases or contacts, and uh, lastly, certainly protect our healthcare system. And again, I I don't w want to I can't leave without saying or stop without saying that our long-term care facilities remain uh, in need of significant support. I'll stop there. Anyone else want to address that question? Anyone else? Uh, Commissioner, can I drop in for a second? This is Dr. Yes, sure does. Uh, yes, there was a question ahead. about the uh, syndromic surveillance and the hotspots um, and how when that would be up and running. We had a question about uh, the syndromic surveillance and the hotspot question and uh, about uh, where that was. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, can I just show a screen here quickly? Yes, go ahead. <clears throat> so this is a blown up map of actually by zip code of the hotspot analysis of the surveys that we have now, which are somewhere north of uh, 1,600 surveys. And the color codes actually indicate the places where people have been calling in by zip code with uh, colors moving from, I guess, dark gray there through red to yellow. And um, you can start to see actually right now uh, where the hotspots are uh, coming in by the syndromic surveillance predictions um, in uh, here in Florida. We have uh, quite a bit going down here in downtown Tampa and some up here in the new Temple Terrace and the Tampa uh, in the uh, new Tampa areas as well. So this is well established now and uh, is up and running, and we are collecting data, which we, of course, would be uh, happy. I'm happy to share this link with anyone who wants so they can go in and look at the dashboard. And uh, anything that uh, the county can do to uh, publicize this and get people to continue to fill in the surveys, uh, the more data we'll be able to collect and the uh, stronger this uh, tool is going to become. And with that, I'd just like to say, uh, I'll turn it all back over to you. Thanks very much. Uh, Dr. Unash, if you can uh, get that link to um, Mr. Merrill, uh, and Mr. Merrill, you can get that out to the members of the of the, uh, of the the emergency policy group. I think that would be something that we all would like to have access to. I know I would. Okay. I believe everyone would. So if you can get it to Mr. Merrill, and Mr. Merrill can get it to us. Uh, Dr. Unash, I, I, we would appreciate it very, very much. I'll get that to you right away after the uh, after the meeting, sir. Okay. Uh, Chairman, Chairman, Chairman Miller, can I just add one more, more thing to that? Just, yes, uh, Dr. Osberg. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that Dr. Unash and Mr. Merrill and myself and the College of Business at USF have been doing along with our geoscientists is we've been working on developing data visualizations like the ones that he just uh, showed you. And it looks like there's the potential to use cell phone data without uh, compromising people's privacy to create heat maps of the area. And so over the next week or so, uh, we're gonna continue to try to use our GIS capabilities, which all of us have in the county and, and at the university at a pretty, at a pretty detailed level uh, to try to give you guys guidance in terms of, of flare ups and areas of concentration. Again, the, using the dial metaphor, this will be a useful thing to look at over time as we see drop-offs and then if, if there are flare-ups, we could send sort of like uh, SWAT teams or public health teams to address specific flare-ups if we're able to track that better over time. So that capability is coming. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Eisenberg. Thank you very much. Commissioner Merman, you recognize. Oh, thank you, Mr. Peer. Um, Really, I want to thank the USF team. Uh, you guys never cease to amaze me. Uh, Dr. Peterson, Dr. Yunesh, and of course, Eric, uh, who I've worked with on many projects. You guys are fabulous. Um, do you all coordinate the assumptions you're using before you develop these models, or do you work independently? I'll let you answer, Eric. I would say as a big bureaucracy, we certainly try to. Sometimes the assumptions are built into the uh, different disciplines. Uh, it's a great question because we always have to be very, very careful to make sure that we're comparing apples and oranges. Uh, but during this process over the last few weeks, uh, we have been uh, very, very focused on making sure that all hands on deck and all telling the same story. So I think you see that in the kind of alignment that that uh, that we've presented. I hope so, anyway. Okay, good. Uh, 
Well, the only other question I have is, of course, everybody's waiting for the governor's announcement tomorrow. Um, and I love your presentation today, but uh, honestly, I think what he says is going to be the roadmap that we have to follow and walk down. Though I think a lot of the uh, principles for action are are similar, especially to John Hopkins' report, which I read, which I thought was fabulous, especially when they talked about the intensity of contact intensity and number of contacts and how they uh, went through all that to establish maybe the reason why we would open up a certain section of our community. Um, so I guess my question is, is um, do you anticipate the governor having similar principles for action or um, are we just waiting to see, are we gonna like drop that into this plan that you're semi putting together? How's that all gonna work? Uh, who are you asking, Sammy? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can, I can tell you. I can tell you. More that question. <laughs> I, I, I think. Let me. I, I can tell you what I think. Weekly charge, by the way. I'll, t I'll tell you what I think, uh, Sandy, and that is that Mr. Merrill and I talked about that uh, at length when we when he pulled this group together, and we could have just sat back and said, "Well, we'll wait with the see what the governor says, and then we'll respond to that." But we think that these principles are going to be important regardless of what happens and so obviously there'll be there may be some alignment challenges but i think it, it behooves us to be proactive about doing the right thing and then deal with the political realities when they when they when they come up um, we really don't have a lot of representation on this Dr. mr berman you, we're losing you uh, i don't know why okay start over um, I don't, we don't have a lot of representation uh, from Tampa and Hillsborough County on that task force, except for Dr. Curris. And of course, I have an uh, unbelievable respect for him and the job he does with Tampa General. Um, but I just, I, I'm kind of concerned that every community is going to be different. I hope he just doesn't do a one size fits all. Uh, approach because it just wouldn't work, especially when we've had such a low number of testing, low percentage of testing. No, Can I stop. offer a, a comment, Mr. Chairman? This is Dean Peterson. Yes, ma'am, Dean Peterson, you recognize. So I th thank you. I, I, I think what you've heard, and I, I hope what you've heard, is that I think all of us together are trying to build the capacity to be responsive to whatever comes down. So the heat map you just saw, um, the more people that respond to it, the more accurate that will be. And then if there are flare ups, we can quickly go there as, as Dean Eisenberg said, with our testing capability, our rapid testing capability, you, you would wanna go in there and test uh, in, 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 intensively so that you could identify cases, contacts, do the quarantine, the isolation, classic public health disease control efforts. We're also trying to, so we're, we're trying to build that surveillance capacity and that, that response capacity. We're also trying to, as Dean Eisenberg said, and why I think it's so important, this notion of engaging the community, because it's the community that's going to make or break all of this. So as we reopen businesses, do they have the capacity to maintain the distancing between the workers and the customers? Do workplaces have the ability to keep workers safe? Um, can people freely move about in our public transit systems? Are there, are there plexiglass barriers between drivers and passengers? Are people comfortable wearing face coverings in, in, in public? All of these, it's, it's all of us working together that are going to enable us to keep that curve down even as we slowly reopen. So I think that's the point of all of this, that we're all working together collectively Put in place the, the, the system approaches that will allow us to rapidly respond, but also to engage our community. So, as we heard from the callers earlier, people want to get back to work, they want to open their businesses, people want to patronize those businesses, but we have to do it in a way that makes sense. And so, and that's where that Johns Hopkins report is so helpful, as, as you said, Commissioner Merman, because they really laid out in some very clear ways. Which which of those sectors are easier to maintain that distancing and are safer? And maybe others need our help. So our ability to create technological solutions, physical barriers, 
make masks available to people. All those things are going to help us get through this, regardless of what the directives are. If we're conscious of what this community needs, then we'll get through this to keep our community safe. Thank you very much. Excellent point. Thank Commissioner you. Miller, I have a question for Dr. Wait a minute, Eisenhower. Commissioner, Commissioner uh, Overman, I don't see your hand up. I got others. Okay. I have others before you, so just hold on. My, my system is working right now. Uh, Mayor Lott, you recognize. Uh, Mayor Lott? Yeah, I'll, okay. I'll choose to make my comments later. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, Ms. Snipe, do you recognize? Thank you, Chair. Um, going back to the, um, well, and first of all, thank you to the USF team. This is very, very um, helpful information. Um, the John, Johns Hopkins report um, is uh, very thorough. I hope that every member on the EPG has had a, a chance to review that report from Johns Hopkins, and I, I'm, I'm hoping we get it to talk about, about that a little bit later um, in anticipation of whatever the governor is going to be announcing um, tomorrow. But um, for back on the, um, the, the heat map, uh, if you could, um, I think maybe Dr. Unish could, could answer this question. Um, is, the, is the information being collected for that mapping, for that model, is it only being collected electronically or are there other ways that, that you're collecting that information? And the reason I ask that is my concern for the percentage or the portion of the population that may not have access to um, reporting that information electronically by email or um, electronic survey. Is there, some, uh, is there another way we're collecting that information? Uh, right now, the answer is it's it's basically all electronic by smartphone, uh, web you know website or um, also also the computer. But we're uh, working with people in the county right now to try and uh, we heard this on uh, the last meeting to try and set up a, uh, a, a you know a, a phone method of actually completing the survey, um, like one of those an annoying phone tree calls: press one for yes, press two for no. So hopefully that will be rolling out as well. And I, I should also mention on the coordination um, uh, with Dr. Eisenberg, uh, I actually have a, a doodle poll out and I'm gonna be scheduling a meeting for all of the interested stakeholders, both uh, at USF and in the uh, healthcare community, um, probably early next week to uh, try and develop a way of uh, developing a platform to combine all of this data together uh, and make a uh, much more augmented and more powerful um, uh, set of maps and heat maps moving forward. We can pull others, uh, other um, data that's similar into this. I think it's going to be very, very useful. So I'm hoping to get everybody together to do that as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. That, I think that's critical because I think we might be missing a portion of the population that may not have access to that, especially the older population who um, you know, may not have uh, the capability of, of participating in an electronic survey online or by uh, email or by smartphone. And so um, that's obviously uh, integral to making sure that your your data models are more accurate. And then, um, um, and so I hope that um, one of the other things that was mentioned um, earlier was the peak, I believe was mentioned that um, April, somewhere around April 8th or April 9th is when we peak with about 400 cases in yes. the county. And so um, I'm hoping that we can foster a conversation today about some action that we might be able to take, of course, based on the governor's, um, whatever he announces tomorrow, but looking, um, anticipating that when we get back together on Monday, um, being very prepared with uh, what our um, order will, will look like if we need to discuss rescinding our safer at home order um, and, and then taking a, a phased approach based on what the governor's actions are or, or and hopefully integrated with the Johns Hopkins recommendation for that phase approach, um, especially interested surrounding the risk assessments um, that are in the different sectors and, um, and taking a look at, at an approach that way so that uh, we can start opening up some of our business. And, and like you said, people are really wanting to get back to work and getting back to some normalcy, but I know that we have to take a, a careful and methodical approach in order to get there. Um, but next week will be the 14 days that is necessary after our peak um, since we peaked around the 8th or the 9th of, of April. So I anticipate that by next Monday or Thursday, we're gonna have to come up with some, some decisions in this group that will, um, that will allow for some of these activities 
to, to begin happening. So thank you very much uh, to the USF team. Again, great information. Mayor Castor, you recognize. Thank you, sir. Uh, just a couple of comments, and I, I agree with Hopkins' report was just fascinating, and thank you. We just can't thank you enough as a group uh, to USF for all that, that you have done, and uh, Dr. Holt and his team as well. One of the things with the contract contact tracing, uh, when uh, the the Dr. Holt and the USF team get that syndro syndromic surveillance all to together, and you need personnel, I think that the county and the city can offer that, um, so that we can start doing that that uh, contact tracing right away and make sure that we're we're handling that as quickly as we can. Now, in the uh, John Hopkins and in Dr. Lockwood's steps, I think they're they're pretty similar, and it talks about uh, the number of new cases has declined for 14 days, but also we have to sort of take that with a grain of salt because we've only tested 1%. So as we ramp up the testing, hopefully that will that um, percentage will continue, and you know the number of cases will show that we are uh, dropping. The rapid di diagnostic testing, we've got that down to 48 hours to uh, three days. Um, healthcare system, able to take care of the parents, check, or patients, check. Then the uh, contact tracing, um, we can take care of that, I feel, as well. So the testing, if we can ramp that up and then get the antibody testing ramped up, then clearly we would be able to open the community back up very safely. But I don't. I don't feel that we're we have the ability to wait two more weeks to open up uh, some of our businesses. That we need to think of that about that and how that looks right now, so that we can get individuals um, back out in to the community uh, working. And as Dr. Peterson said, we can those steps with the social distancing, uh, with the disinfecting uh, steps, uh, with the facial cover coverings that will allow individuals to get back out into the community in certain uh, service provision. Jobs uh, that they've been prevented of from performing up to this point, and then until we can get that antibody train, antibody testing um, up and running rapidly in our community, I know that our our tests uh, that we have ordered in the count that the county has ordered and the city has ordered as well are you know that the arrival date keeps getting pushed back and pushed back. So it's my hope that we can uh, come to some some decisions on opening the community back up and what that looks like, but. I do believe that it's going to have to be done with the social wherever possible and wherever it's not with the, uh, the facial coverings. And also, as everyone else has stated, I want to echo that it's not a one size fits all here in, in our city in Tampa, uh, you know, isn't going to be the same as, as the other cities. And our density is much higher. And then the, the ingress that we have on a daily basis uh, for individuals to come into the city to work. So it may look different in the county than it does in city or temple terrace and Tampa. and then also on top of that i think that we need to have pinellas pasco and hillsborough all looking at the same stipulations for reopening our communities so that we aren't taking certain steps that one of the other counties may not have that cross contamination so uh, just my thoughts on on the whole issue thank you Thank you. Commissioner Oval, when you recognize. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Eisenberg, um, you know, one of the things that I've noticed this week after we uh, heard that there might be an opportunity to open back up and where we were and keep the safe at home rules in place. There were um, uh, some confusion among our citizens about what the rules were. Some people thought that we had completely taken away the, the stay at home. 
So it, I think it's going to be critically important that we have a robust communications plan to help our citizens and our business owners know what the rules are or what the opportunities are to play a part in keeping our community safe. Um, for example, FEMA has come out with a addressing uh, PPEs or face coverings in non-healthcare settings report that we received the other day. If people recognize that the way we're going to be able to open up businesses and have put people to work is being able to do the social distancing and being able to provide facial coverings for their employees so they can keep their employees safe, you know, then, then if they can start getting ready for that, we can put out a call to seamstress all over the country, all over the county uh, to make facial coverings so that we're not hurting our, our, our healthcare professionals that absolutely need the official PPE covers to stay safe. But we have to be clear if, if, if the people that spoke open earlier today say, well, the governor's opening the state tomorrow. Um, we find ourselves in a position where we're fighting an uphill battle of confusion, and it's that confusion that unfortunately is going to cause a massive spread of this virus. So I think we need to be very clear about where we're going before we start saying, well, we're going to do this next week. Because that is, we are not ready for that based on the core state preparedness responsibilities outlined in the White House plan, as well as in the John Hopkins. So can you offer us some assistance on how we communicate with our communities and business owners to help them get ready for this so that they are best positioned to know what they will need to do in order to open their businesses? And I'll close that. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Chairman Miller, if I, if I could respond. Um, yes, sir. That, that I very much would welcome that opportunity. I think, I also think, uh, Commissioner Overman, that people are very motivated at this point to do the right thing. I think the challenge of this from the very beginning has been one of mixed messages and rumors and things like that. And so um, I see myself as working hand in glove with Liana and the communication team to try to, to really push out um, not just FAQs, but engaged conversations where we can clarify again and again and again that this is, this is what we know, these are the rules. The challenge, of course, is that they don't stay the same. <laughs> they, they evolve over time and things happen. And so um, it's not like uh, something you could print on a note card and pass out and have it be, you know, remain the same. But, we're going to do the best we can to uh, develop a crisp and concise message. Um, and I, like I said, I think people are, are, are desperate for that level of certainty. Um, and I think we're going to give them as much certainty as we can. Thank you, sir. Mayor Lada, I see your hand. You want to uh, make some comments now? Yes, thank you, sir. I, um, I really enjoyed listening to everyone's comments. It seemed like uh, we're uh, heading in the right direction, and uh, I love Mayor Castor's comments as well about we need to get open now, and uh, but obviously in the proper way. I don't want to. Um, uh, I, I think it's prudent for us also to not jump in front of the governor. I think any time that we jump in front of the governor right now, uh, all the confusion that we've been talking about on on, on this group here, um, you know, we zap, you know, we we just in increase that confusion by trying to get in front of the governor. So I hope we don't bring forth actual processes in place do we know exactly uh what that that, that decision is um you know so, so far i think we've had a lot of information from our medical teams and so forth and groups from usf i think it's all good information and so forth but um i, I think it would be wise for us to, since um i believe dr holt's team's not presenting both days next week okay so i would assume he's not presenting on monday since he presented today I would love for us to uh, bring in two individuals to speak uh, to, to us and so that we have a, a balance of information on both sides. But to me, I don't know how we decide on a plan or decision or, 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 or what actions we're going to take without looking at the economic aspects of that decision and, the, and what the economic, economics are in our community right now. I would like for us on Monday, if there's a, then I would suggest this unless there's a lot of opposition from the group here, uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, USF professor, uh, Dr. Zingfrei Guam, 
He's at our bomb center, and he is actually a uh, uh, world-renowned economist in agriculture. There's a big concern, especially in the community I'm in, that we are we're having a certain break in the, the food supply, and uh, and I'm really worried about what's going to happen. Maybe not today, but six months, seven months, eight months out. And I, I know we don't want to. I don't. I know we don't want to do something that breaks that chain of uh, in, in, our, in our food supply. I would recommend for us to bring him in on Monday to be able to discuss that um, from an economic standpoint. And I'd also like for us to hear from another economist, someone that's from the private sector, maybe someone from Raymond James or so forth, that I can make a recommendation. So that we we we're considering the economics of the decisions we're making now as well, because we have a lot of citizens that we've mentioned that are hurting in our community, and um, and, uh, and and I think we need to acknowledge it and, and, and hear what the economics of our decisions are. So um, I, I would just simply say, you know, if we could bring uh, a couple of those individuals in on Monday uh, um, to add to our meeting, and I also want to mention this, you know, the devil's in the detail. You know, I, I, I hear the reports and I know we want to be safe and I know that we want to um, make sure that um, that we don't have a resurgence with COVID-19. We're all on board with that. No, no one wants to see a resurgence there. But I also know that we realize it's not going away next month or the month out there. This is something we have to learn how to live with. OK, and we have been learning how to live with it for the past, you know, uh, 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 five to six weeks that we've been dealing with it. And. Um, I hope that when we talk about these restrictions, that when we talk about opening up the economy, if we're going to be putting restrictions on every single business aspect, like, uh, you know, uh, mandates on hotels and and uh, um, and restaurants and so forth, I, I, I believe that we're talking about going down a road to where it sounds like we're reopening the economy, but we're not. There's already a lot of pressure already built into the business sector. If you, if you own a hotel, for instance, you're going to have to be able to prove to the marketplace that it's clean, that it's safe, that it's COVID-free, or, or people are not going to come. You already have that pressure on it. There's already a, a percentage of people that's going to take a long time before they have the comfort into going into a restaurant, going into uh, you know a, a dining establishment, a, 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 a hotel. So, so uh, for us to put a, a lot of additional mandated restrictions on top of that, I hope that's not what we're talking about. I hope we're talking about educating and, and, and letting the free market system work its magic into doing more than what we've probably required to begin with. So uh, I, I don't think we, I, I hope that the devil in the detail doesn't mean that uh, we're putting on more restrictions what we have today. Because, uh, you know, when I, when I listen to this, I, I, I kind of feel like that's where we're kind of headed towards. And I, and, uh, and, I, and I hope we don't. I hope we uh, allow our, our markets to react fast and have faith that, that people are going to do the right thing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Mayor Castro, you recognize. I'm sorry, I didn't take my hand down. Okay, all right. Okay, I don't see any other hands. Uh, let me thank uh, Dr. Holt from the uh, Department of Health and uh, Dean Peterson, uh, Dr. Levine and Dr. Eisenberg from the greatest university in the land. Uh, that came forth and brought this great presentation and all the work they do to mow the minds of young people out there and turn out some pretty good graduates like myself. So thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, is Mayor Ross back on? Commissioner Ross? Yes, Commissioner, I'm back. I'm sorry I oh. dropped off there. Okay. I just, uh, and then Dr. Unash, I'm sorry. Dr. Unash, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. I didn't put his name, he wasn't on there. Okay, all right, uh, we're gonna go into uh, action to extend the declaration of local emergencies. Ms. Beck. Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon, APG board members, Christine Beck. You have been provided with a draft order in your materials for your consideration um, if you should, should choose to uh, extend the declaration for an additional seven days. Okay, we have to take some action on that. Is there any conversation before we take action? I'll move approval. I'm sorry. I'll move approval, Mr. Merman. Okay, Mr. Merman moves the uh, approval of the of the extension. Is there a second? Is there a second? Second, Mayor Castor. Okay, we have motion by Commissioner Merman, second by Mayor Castor. Is there further discussion? Commissioner Miller, this is Andy Ross. Yes, sir. You recognize. My hand, my raise hand is not working there. I wanted to ask Christine a couple of questions, if that's okay. That's right, you recognize. 
Okay, Ms. Beck, I have a couple of questions. I'll, in the interest of time, I'll ask them both together if that's okay. And, and um, I dropped off for three or four minutes. So if you've been over this, I, I apologize to everybody, but um, two questions. One involves our current stay at home order, safer at home order. Um, and and I ask this for some clarity, both for my sake and for the public's sake. And I thank Mr. Merrill for kind of mentioning this earlier in the meeting, but as I understand it, um, the entire state is currently under the governor's safer at home or, at safer at home order, so that all the current restrictions that are in place are, are pursuant to that order. Now, it is true that there is a local order uh, in place also, but that local order mirrors the same language as the governor's order. So, if we did rescind that order today, uh, it would have no effect whatsoever on anything because we're still under the governor's order. So my question for you at the bottom of all this, there is a question. My, my question is, is there any, are there any ways in which our local order is more restrictive than the governor's order? That, that's my first question. My second question is, when the governor begins to incrementally ease restrictions uh, across the state and open up certain types of businesses and permit certain types of activities to resume, what's the mechanism look like for us, for that to take effect in Hillsborough County? In other words, do we have to meet and scale our local or discuss scaling our local order back to reflect those changes in order for them to become effective? Or do they become effective when the governor orders them. And, and the reason I ask this is, uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of, as of, ha as of us having a local order in place that is essentially the same as the statewide order? Is, is, this, um, is this still necessary or are we creating an unnecessary order here? And those are my two questions. Um, yes, sir. Let me try to respond to those in order. The first one being whether our local safer at home order was more restrictive. And I would say, no, it was not more restrictive. In fact, we had tried to allow um, a little bit more latitude with the non-essential businesses. However, when the governor's order came out, um, that superseded our order in terms of any, you know, we could not be in conflict. And so the governor's order is the controlling order and um and uh, your second question i think was whether uh what happens with the governor's uh next steps and how will it uh affect us locally and unfortunately until we see what the order looks like it's going to be very difficult to give a um detailed or proper response to your question because I've I've heard, I don't know how it will be rolled out, but there is a possibility that the statewide order could treat different regions of the state differently or different counties differently. Um, you may recall that there's been a number of orders uh, issued by the governor that only apply to certain counties, such as Dade and Broward and Palm Beach, so really, until we see what results from the task force um, uh, recommendations, which as I understand it, those are due tomorrow, um, and then what that results in terms of an order, it will turn on whether there's language that allows leeway in different communities or if he's, if he's going to mandate um, certain aspects throughout the state. So. Um, I'm not sure if I answered everything, but um, if I didn't and you clarify, I'll try to do it again. No, you did fine. Thank you, Ms. Beck. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank Ms. Stavley, are you, are you addressing the motion? Um, yes, I believe so. It is a question for um, Ms. Beck uh, with regard to the order. So um, yes, Chairman, if I might have the floor. You, you recognize, you recognize. Thank you. Um, so last, last week, uh, or the last meeting, we t you mentioned a little bit about um, potential latitudes uh, that we might have with um, within our uh, county compared to the order from the governor. Um, what, what what 
would be an example of some of the latitudes that we do have, knowing that even though the governor's orders do, does have uh, apparently more restrictions to it, that there were some latitudes or could, could be some latitudes in Hillsborough County. Uh, yes, Ms. Snively. Um, the latitude that I was referencing is directly related to the document that was produced by the governor's office that was titled the FAQs that was trying to help understand the intent of the executive order number 20-91. And specifically, it had a uh, question and answer that said as follows. Are local authorities allowed to adopt requirements directly on businesses, operations, or venues, including buildings, beaches, and parks that may be stricter than the governor's executive order? And the answer was yes. And, and so what that was, how that was interpreted widely behind the state or throughout the state was that uh, local jurisdictions could, for example, close beaches. Um, and you can extrapolate that if they were allowed to be stricter and close the beaches, they then could also open the beaches when they deemed it um, prudent. So um, while the governor's order is very specific and cannot be superseded when it comes to essential activities or essential services, um, and where the governor also made it very clear that if you are a um, non-essential business, that you must close your physical location. That was part of his FAQs as well. He also provided some um, leeway when it came to things such as beaches and parks. And so what would it look like if that is something that we wanted to do um, would, as far as changing our, our order, um, would, would we need to modify our order in open to uh, in order to, for example, uh, reopen some parks or beach areas or elapse, would that be something that we would need to um, modify in our order and then and then subsequently vote on that separately? Um, Ms. Snively, as I look through all of our orders and, I, and we do not have an order that I could locate that specifically addresses uh, such things as our parks or beaches, um, I believe that was done um, through the delegated authority to the county administrator, and, and certainly Mr. Merrill can address that. Um, if, if this group wanted to change any of that, I do think it would be prudent to have a, a discussion and a vote on it so that there is proper direction. Okay, and I'll, I'll end there because this is turning into a different uh, potential agenda item for next week, I think. so. Thank you for your, thank you for the information, Ms. Beck. You're welcome. Thank you, Mayor Lott. Mayor Lott, you gonna address the motion on the floor? Mayor Lott? You there, sir? Okay. I have a question for uh, Ms. Beck, if you don't mind. To the, to the motion, yes, you recognize. Um, Ms. Beck, the, um, is there any reason why we should keep the safer at home in place right now versus what we have under the governor's order? Is there any tangible reason why from a legal standpoint? Um, no, sir. If you recall, when we first were grappling with how to address the governor's order, we, um, I believe the group just understood that we would be interpreting them and would recognize that the governor's order superseded our order. But if for any reason you didn't want to have that order in place, um, I don't see what would be lost if it was um, not in place because we are following the governor's order at this time. So basically we have an order in place for no reason, is that correct? It, it was done and it was left in place. If you choose to take it, um, rescind it, that would be your prerogative. Thank you. Another question. If the governor, for some reason, came out with a new order tomorrow, and, um, and let's say he made certain decisions, but then we have our current order in place, and it was more restrictive than his, and he didn't preempt us, what, what would happen that, in that situation? Typically, you would read you would read them together, and if the governor's order is controlling, or if our order is in conflict, then it it, it is 
it is uh, not effective. Um, I think the legal interpretation would be that the governor's order would control. Thank you very much. Commissioner Berman to the motion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Christine, I really need for you to say this because it's important. I mean, even as we talk, I'm getting these emails. The governor's order is less restrictive than ours. People do not understand the governor preempted all other stay at home or safer at home orders. His order is the predominant order. Is that correct? That is correct. And that is a reading from both the order 2091 as well as that subsequent order that came out, number 2092, and it reads as follows. This order shall supersede any conflicting official action or order issued by local officials in response to COVID-19. So as a result of those two, the governor's orders have been the um, controlling orders. Um, and uh, the other comment I want to make, and um, goes to Ms. Snively's comment. Um, and Mr. Merrill did take that option. Um, that is not in our order, the parks and beaches, right? Or is it? I could not find it in any written order. I think not. it was. So I think that's another education and information item that we can get out to the public that that was an action taken by our administrator. Um, and I, I can, as a county commissioner, I mean, this is a, definitely a county commission item. Um, and not uh, for any other <laughs> government. Now I know Mayor Castor has her, her parks and I'm sure the other mayors have their parks. Um, but honestly, um, we closed our parks because I looked into it because people were congregating and going against the CDC guidelines. So um, Mr. Chair, I, I mean, it's not to be addressed right now because we're um, on the declaration of a local emergency order but I would like to be recognized um, for a motion after we dispose of this item. Okay, I, I will recognize you. And, I, and, and we have gotten our discussion way off base. Um, yeah. Ms. Ms. Beck, we're just basically now uh, taking a vote on extending the local emergency order to allow this body to meet, am I correct? Correct. Okay, and this is you all got off base. I didn't interrupt you. If we were in kind of commission meeting, I would have ruled you out of order, but I didn't do that. So we have a motion by Commissioner Merman, second by Commissioner, o I think it was right, by Commissioner Merman, second by Commissioner Overland uh, to extend the declaration. Well, I'm sorry, okay. To extend the declaration of local emergency. Seeing no further discussion, please call the roll. <clears throat> Miller? Yes. Overman? I'm sorry? Overman? I'll come back to you, Merman. Yes, yes. Cronister? Yes. Caster? Yes. Ross? Yes. Lot? Yes. Snively? Yes. And Overman? Yes. I heard a yes. Motion carried eight to zero. Okay. Now we're going to public, uh, public and to EPG discussions. Commissioner Merman, you recognize. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I know um, there's been a lot of discussion, um, especially with our offices, about uh, opening up parks and beaches. Um, that was not a part of our um, safer at home order. Um, and so I'd like to just ask Mr. Merrill if he could um, bring a report back at our next meeting about the feasibility of opening up the parks and beaches uh, we only have two beaches. It's um, uh, E.G. Simmons and Apollo Beach, with our, which are both in my district. 
and if um, see the about the feasibility of opening those back up, um, we will have the information from the governor's um, actions tomorrow. And I think it'll be prudent for us at that point to possibly take some action. So that's my request. Mr. Merman, Mr. Merman I understand your request, um, but this body cannot open, this body cannot open the county's parks or beaches. Well, and Mr. Merrill, maybe he should come on board because he actually took the actions as the uh, chief administrator of, of the EPG. He is our spokesperson for the EPG. Um, and I think that's my understanding. So I'll just ask Mr. Merrill if he could clarify or point us in the right direction on how we should do this. Mr. Merrill, you recognize? Yes, certainly. Um, so that action was taken very early on at the beginning of this crisis uh, in closing uh, when I took the action under my authority granted to me by the declaration to close county facilities. And uh, so that was the reason to do it. It was a good reason to do it. And as you heard earlier, it helped to um, save lives. It helped to slow the spread of the virus. Um, I will tell you that when we tried for a couple of days early on to open the parks back up, there was nothing but bad behavior that was in in, in direct uh, opposition to social distancing. There were threats made by employees. My employees felt unsafe trying to enforce, and I said, we're closing the parks. So the parks are no different than any other facility that should be governed by all of the protocols, by all of the uh, prudent actions that were described earlier by the USF public health folks. I think once the governor issues his order, everyone will be clearer about how we're going to approach an opening or reopening. And um, my position is that unless, you know, unless the group wants to overrule my decision or the county commission does, that we wait until there are uh, guidelines in place, either through the governor's order or through this group that would apply to parks as well. Can I just ask you possibly Monday to, that we bring it back for discussion that we know what the guidelines are? Well, what I'm just saying is by Monday, we'll know what the governor's order is. And if the governor's order directs that everything be opened up, then we know the answer because as Christine said, the governor's order will supersede any local orders. So, I mean, the, the, what what governs here, what, what gives us direction is whatever the governor's decision is. And then from that, we can, you, you all can make whatever decisions that, that you want. In that respect. Would the EPG make the decision or the... Um, well, I guess that's a question, a question for Christine. If again, it, so again, it depends on what the governor's order says. If, it, if the governor's order allows leeway for local jurisdictions, my opinion is that parks are no different than any other facility in that respect, and that if the EPG is going to adopt some phased in approach to reopening, that park should be considered along with all the other, all other facilities. Um, unless the EPG takes an action to carve out parks and allow the county commission to deal with it. Okay. Okay. So um, we'll bring it back for discussion on Monday when we know more. I, yeah, I know exactly. people are chomping at the bit to um, just get outside and recreate. And I noticed in the John Hopkins report, it does have parks, um, beaches, walking paths, trails, car parks are con low intensity contact, uh, low number of contacts, low modification potential. So I think it's one of those um, that they feel are a lower threat, but I understand what you're saying. I mean, we cannot have our staff threatened. We cannot have, um, 
you know, people congregating and not uh, applying the social distance rules and going against the CDC guidelines. So I guess this is going to be one of those issues that um, we're going to have to carefully look at. Well, and, and so we did look around at our neighboring uh, counties. There's not unanimous position on this. So not every county has decided to open up their parks or their trails. Uh, some of them are taking a more surgical approach. Um, so until today and until this week, this group, the commission, the county, or the county, or the community, and I didn't have the benefit of the data that you heard today about where we are. Um, I certainly wasn't going to take an action to put my staff and the community at risk without having the benefit of the data that you got today. So that was my reasoning, that was my approach, um, and I stick by it. Yeah. Okay. Um, Lott, you're recognized. As I listen to this conversation between us today here and the confusion that all these orders have in place, and from listening to our county administrator and from listening to our county attorney, uh, it sure seems to me like the wise thing to hear would be to remove the safer home order we have right now and to live under the governor's order until we have whatever the new governor's order is. And then we can decide if we're preempted, then we're preempted you know, by the governor. If we're not preempted, then we would have the guidelines to start building um, um, our next plan of action for, our, for our, our, our rollout, however we decide to roll it out, you know, in line with the governor's action. But right now, if, if we're having this much trouble with the confusion of our orders and so forth, I just can't imagine the public has. And obviously from the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of emails we're all receiving, uh, they're, they're, we're being asked to take an action that's actually a, an ask from uh, the governor himself. So um, I, I don't know if, if, this, if you want to take action like that today, if not, you know, then I, I, I will definitely be making this motion on Monday. Um, so uh, I just want to take the temperature from the group. You know, since we have a redundant order, why don't we remove, remove the confusion? So we, you know, have some clarification so that we can take action uh, next week. That by that by Monday, we would know what our uh, what the direction is from the governor. So I'm not making a motion yet. I like take the temperature from everybody. You know? Mayor Lott, this is this is this is Commissioner Miller. I believe now if we today tried to remove our order even though the governor's order supersedes ours i think you have more confusion over the weekend than you'd have right now so i would suggest that we just wait until the governor's order comes out tomorrow after his task force is rendered what they will give to him he then puts out another order and the monday we come back i think we have a much clearer picture of where we are i think right now we did we if even though our order does the same thing as the governor's order, I think you're gonna have some confusion because I'm getting emails from people saying, well, the governor's order is less restrictive. Well, it's not. And you're gonna have all kind of confusion out there. No tell them what we would have this weekend and we really don't wanna get into that, that mess right now. So I just think we should just wait until Monday. That's Mr. my Chairman, opinion. Mr. Chairman, I respect your opinion. I agree with you and I'll wait till Monday, okay? Thank you. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Uh, Ms. Nye, do you recognize? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, thank you, Mayor Lott, for bringing that up today because um, uh, I think that, that uh, the community, community feels strongly that the Safer at Home order is a redundant order under the governor's order, and so I'd be supportive of uh, seconding that motion on Monday. And thank you for waiting until um, Chair Miller to um, uh, although it, you know, I know there's a, it feels like there's some urgency in the situation, um, I think it's fair for us to wait until Monday after the governor has made his announcement and then allow us to um, see more of the data, understand what the new order is going to look like and hear from our constituents before making that decision um, as, a, as a group on Monday. So thank you so much uh, for deferring that. And the other, the other item I, I would really like to, to talk about, if we could also add to the agenda on, on Monday is um, a little bit about the responsibility of the emergency policy group from now until we stop convening. Um, this is a very unique situation. This group was probably put together more for hurricanes and other emergencies, not national or uh, um, excuse me, not public health uh, issues like pandemics. 
Um, but I'd really, I think it's, um, there's a little bit of, of um, it's unclear, there, there's a lack of clarity in the community uh, and maybe amongst the members of the group as to what our exact role is going to be as an emergency policy group from now until uh, this is over or when, when we stop convening. And um, uh, we're certainly, um, we're certainly trying to do our best with the information that we have. Um, and I don't know when that the last uh, meeting that we will have will be. However, um, there's also a lot of pressure for, for us to be coming up with um, a plan for economic uh, revitalization. And I don't know that that's part of um, our, uh, per, you know, we're purview uh, of the EPG. So maybe we can talk a little bit about that as an agenda item on Monday as well. What is our responsibility as EPG until from now until we halt our convening? Thank you. Okay. Uh Commissioner Merman, you recognize. Commissioner Miller, I've been asking to raise my hand forever. Could I speak, please? Well, I haven't seen your hand, Commissioner Overman. That's why I haven't it's called on you. It's been raised. I haven't seen it, Commissioner Overman. Commissioner Overman, you recognize. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Um, I, I I understand people's eagerness to um, move and recognize what the governor is doing. Hillsborough County is a very large county. We have a lot of people and we put a safer at home order in place in order to get where we are now, which is a reduction in the number of people that were infected by this virus. That is our job to act in an emergency given we have a public health emergency, which also includes making sure that our people are actually able to take care of themselves and eat and have access to food and a variety of other things. What's most important at this point is to hear what we heard today from our physicians and medical professionals who have basically said that the first steps, the having the testing, having rapid testing, having a syndromic process of being able to surveil our community to measure our risk is critically important. And we haven't changed, and nothing of that has changed based on what the governor is saying. That is still our responsibility. And to while the governor may find that relaxing those rules might work for other areas of this county, this county, our Florida Department of Health representative, Dr. Holt, needs more help for us to get those things done. So I was going to ask Dr. Held, what things can the county do to give him the resources he needs to be able to get those core preparedness responsibilities that we are required to have as a county in place? Do we need more people? Does he need more money? Do we need more rapid tests? What do we need in order to be ready to consider doing anything or any modifications for our safer at home orders? Because until we have that answer and we know that we are able to do the surveillance that we heard our medical professionals and university professionals tell us about today, we are, would be irresponsible to relax the rules we have in place. We've been successful because our citizens have participated in that process. I'm very proud of them. But to take, take those away right now, we'll end up with a resurgence that we heard Dr. Yunash talk about in July and will keep us from doing the things that we need to do in the fall. So if Dr. Holt can ask, help us know what it is he needs, to be able to accomplish our preparedness responsibilities as a county, then, then I'd be willing to consider some modification the stay at home. But I, I would not support an effort in that respect at all today because it would create confusion among our citizens at this point who don't know how to keep ourselves safe when they go back to work. Thank you. Well, Commissioner Oldman, no one today said anything about modifying the stay at home uh, emergency clause right at all. No one has said anything about that today. In fact, we bet we all said, wait until the governor's uh, executive order tomorrow and then we'll address it on Monday. But Dr. Holt, if you're still there, please answer Commissioner Wolverine's question. Uh, hello, can you hear me? 
Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Um, again, I think it's been a long day, uh, uh, and I don't mean to be flippant. I haven't been asked that question in 20 years. But thank you. Uh, no. Um, I would like to actually to make an informed decision. Uh, could I bring that back on Monday? Uh, that's a, it's not an easy com, uh, question to ask, and I want to have a, a basis for anything that really talks about it. I'm, I, you know, I, if, if I was so, I would respectfully ask for that time. Mr. Dr. Holt, I think that would be a perfect time to bring it back, because as I said, today no one's addressing uh, doing anything with our executive order, with our uh, executive order at all. We just made a decision we would wait until Monday to see what the, the governor's executive order would be. And at that particular point in time, that's probably when you would be best to bring that information back uh, and address it at that time. Yes, sir. Mr. Mayor, you, I'm sorry. You gonna say something, Dr. Holt? I, I just said I will. Okay, thank you. Mr. Well, Commissioner Merman, you recognize? Um, no, I took my hand down. Commissioner Oldman, you recognize? Okay. Um, I don't see any other hands. Does anyone else want to address anything at the meeting today? Anyone else? Mr. Merrill, is there anything you want to bring forth? Uh, nothing else from us, no. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I, I have to do this. I'm getting texts from different people telling me to wish you happy birthday online. So from all of us and from the community, <laughs> we love you. You're doing a great job. You're a wonderful leader. Happy birthday, sir. Thank you very much, Mayor Lott. I appreciate that. And, and uh, remember, folks, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very senior citizen now. So we start talking about putting things in place. Remember that. <laughs> I appreciate it, Mayor Lott. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> if we have no other business to come before us today, I ask everyone to have a great weekend. Stay safe. And we'll get back together Monday at, at 1.30. Uh, see you no further business. We'll adjourn.